have been uh, adopted. Uh, again, good evening. My name is Zachary Parker, uh, Ward 5 representative and president of the State Board of Education. On behalf of the members of the District of Columbia State Board of Education, I welcome our guests and our viewing public uh, to this Wednesday, October 20th public meeting. It is again being held virtually uh, to protect members of the public. Uh, the video for all of our meetings, including tonight's, are posted on our YouTube page uh, at DCSBOE and rebroadcasted on the District Knowledge Network. Last month, the State Board uh, previewed uh, a new agenda format where we shifted our panel discussion earlier in the meeting uh, to provide ample time for public comment after the panel, as well as providing both panelists and public witnesses a better sense of timing for their testimony. Uh, it worked pretty well, and so we will continue with that format tonight and continue to move forward with that approach for the rest of 2021. Our panel discussion tonight, I'm quite excited uh, for it, is it, and it is centered around accountability, uh, which is a topic top of mind for many in the district. Uh, for over uh, 20 years, the term accountability has been used uh, across the country uh, to categorize uh, and often penalize schools, teachers, and students as being failures without ordering enough support uh, to make the kind of systemic changes needed uh, to shift the paradigm. Uh, in the district, we use a statewide ac accountability system called the STAR framework. Uh, STAR was proposed by the Office of the State Superintendent of Education and approved by the State Board uh, in 2017. Since that time, we have seen uh, the system in work. Uh, we have heard from members of the public. Uh, we have uh, seen the consequences of the implementation of the system. Um, and there are conversations currently at the board around necessary revisions. Uh, the state board is committed to working with ASI as a partner and revising the framework. Uh, and we appreciate uh, ASI's partnership in this respect uh, to give a, a more full and richer picture of uh, school quality. Uh, tonight's panel discussion will advance the work uh, and continue our ongoing conversation on the matter uh, by examining new and different approaches uh, to accountability. Uh, we will also be considering six ceremonial resolutions, uh, an adjustment to our vaccination mandate for uh, the three offices of the state board, uh, as well as voting on uh, a variety of policy matters or resolutions rather. Uh, first, the State Board will consider a resolution approving education uh, preparation standards. As the public is aware, uh, ASI has done uh, work over the summer and well into the fall informing the State Board and members of the public around the utility of our education preparation standards and how we hope our new standards will affect teacher quality in the district. We are grateful uh, for the our ASI's partnership in this respect, as well as uh, the work of our I'm grateful for the work of my colleagues um, in making sure that these standards reflect um, what is necessary for our students' success. Um, one thing I would uh, tout uh, and that I'm a proud of for the board is that uh, these standards now uh, address um, reading in a way that they had not before. Uh, second, we will also consider a resolution uh, that will recommend that the state superintendent ensure that education standards, materials, and perhaps most importantly, our teachers are inclusive of the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, I am deeply grateful uh, to a former School Without Wall student, Will Beckerman, uh, for bringing this issue to the state board and working closely with us on uh, this. And we will take this up in a, a one of our resolution votes tonight. And then finally, I am proud to bring forward a resolution along with my colleagues, Representatives uh, Sutter and Reed, uh, related to increasing the physical safety of our students and improving safe passage for all students across the district. Uh, safe passage is a vital part of every school day because it, uh, it impacts every student as they are traveling to and from school. Uh, the district has unfortunately seen a rise in violence and traffic casualties uh, that are directly impacting our students. Uh, the resolution um, that will be considered tonight by the state board has been carefully drafted uh, to be active and specific in its recommendations and will be one of many steps that the board takes uh, in the coming months around this topic. Uh, before we go forward in our meeting, I would like to take a moment um, that has become unfortunately a tradition now uh, to pause to remember the lives that we've lost 
uh, to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Unfortunately, Dr. Grant uh, is not able to join us tonight, uh, but in her stead, we have Mr. Justin Tooley, who will share remarks on behalf of ASI. And uh, Mr. Tooley, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Welcome. Thank you, President Parker. Although it has been a bit of time since I've been with the full board personally, it is good to be with each of you this evening. My name is Justin Tooley, and I'm the interim chief of staff at ASI. Superintendent Grant is unable to be with you this evening, and these monthly meetings and opportunities to speak to the full board in public session are really important to us. So I will be providing her remarks tonight in her absence. Over the past couple of months, the board has facilitated opportunities for public comment on school reopening efforts. These opportunities for public feedback are critical to our collective effort to finish the fight against the pandemic. Last week, Mayor Bowser announced an additional $22 million to support COVID-19 mitigation efforts in DC public schools. The funding will allow DCPS to strengthen its layered mitigation strategy, which includes testing, contact tracing, and notification, and also hire additional staff support to, to respond to COVID-19. In addition, the district made available over $17 million to do the same thing in our public charter school local education agency. OSI continues to do its part to ensure that students can return to in-person learning as safely as possible. This includes providing daily support to our LEAs as they continue to operationalize COVID-19 response operations. Last week, we made progress towards our COVID-19 testing efforts. In our Aussie supported testing program with Shield T3, we tested more than 10% of enrolled students in both DCPS and public charter schools. We will continue to work with our schools and our vendors to increase asymptomatic testing even more over the next few weeks. OSI also released guidance operationalizing Mayor's Order 2021-109, which pertained to the COVID-19 vaccination requirement for adults who had really in schools or child care facilities and for student athletes. As you may recall, the Mayor's Order requires these groups to be vaccinated against COVID-19. The order does permit a test out option for individuals and if they have been granted a medical or religious exemption. This guidance, along with forms for exemption, are located on the Aussie website for their Library of COVID-19 guidance for your reference. Collectively, we believe that these investments and efforts are making a real impact in keeping our schools open and safe for our students, staff, and community. Next, I would like to turn to the evening's agenda. Aussie asked the board to approve SR 21-6, the Education Preparation Standards of our Rural Resolution. Aussie believes that strong educator preparation, ongoing educator professional development and support, and human capital decisions grounded in actionable educator workforce data will lead to improved educator practice and increased student achievement. Over the past several years, the board has engaged Aussie in meaningful ways on all of these issues. We are pleased to be making steady progress on this work. Tonight, consistent with the board's statutory authority, we ask you to approve our educator preparation provider standards. OSSI proposes using the standards created by the Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation or CAPE. These standards are used by 35 states and have been historically used by the District of Columbia. We are asking the board to approve CAPE's 2022 standards. OSSI uses these standards to review educator preparation providers in the district. The purpose of OSSI's review is to determine whether these providers are approved to prepare future educators who are eligible to earn an OSSI educator credential. CAPE's recently updated standards provide for meaningful review and support for our educator preparation providers. First, they require that these providers equip teachers with needed content and pedagogical knowledge and provide relevant clinical partnerships and practice. Second, they enable evaluation of how institutions recruit and support their teacher candidates throughout their time in school. Finally, they require providers to demonstrate impact on teacher preparation, in teacher preparation and effectiveness and ensure that these providers are meaningfully responding to candidate performance data and make continued improvements with that data. 
The district is uniquely situated and many of our teachers are trained outside of our jurisdiction. Yet this is a meaningful way to ensure that the district's future educators that are trained right here in the district have a quality preparation experience. The board has wisely placed special interests on efforts to improve literacy instruction and outcomes. Aussie's upcoming notice of proposed rulemaking which will specifically reference the SBOE, SBOE approved standards, will also require that all subject area programs in, in EPPs with the primary responsibility for literacy instruction prepare future teachers in the science of reading. This is a significant step forward and reflects the persistent and meaningful input of board members, including Ward 2's representative Chang and others. Tonight's vote on these standards will culminate months of engagement with which started in May of this year. But our work on teacher workforce issues has just started. In November, Aussie staff will once again present its working session on our teacher data collection and reporting efforts. In December, we look forward to participating in a council hearing on teacher retention efforts in the district. And later this winter, we will release information on teacher retention. This report will be followed by an updated comprehensive teacher workforce report in the spring and for the first time, school level data files on the teacher workforce that include data on diversity, staffing, and retention. Aussie believes quite strongly that this is a significant step forward in the direction that we all want to go. And this work has certainly been elevated and enhanced by your advocacy and work. I want to especially thank our hardworking team in the Division of Teaching and Learning at Aussie. Specifically, Dr. Siobhan Gibson, the Assistant Superintendent of Back Business, and her Director of Educator Quality and Effectiveness, Elizabeth Ross. They have worked extremely hard and have demonstrated their expertise in getting us to this point. I encourage the board to approve these standards this evening. Thank you again for affording us the opportunity to engage you, and especially for the work that you do to improve education outcomes in the district. My staff will be in and out of the meeting uh, tonight as you conduct your business. Thank you, Mr. Tooley. Uh, members, we are now going to move ahead to our uh, panel discussion uh, for the evening. Um, as we all know, our accountability and assessment committee uh, chaired by representatives Wadenberg and Patterson um, has been working uh, very hard this year to move uh, from our September 2020 resolution uh, into a period of learning and exploration. Uh, and tonight's panel continues in that work. I am pleased to welcome uh, Rashida Young, uh, Chief School Performance Officer at the DC Public Charter School Board, uh, Itai Mizrov, uh, Senior Consultant at IBG Consulting Group, um, and Dr. Robert Simmons from the School of Education at American University. Uh, they will serve as our panelists uh, for tonight. Each panelist will have five minutes for their uh, respective testimony, and then we'll do a round of questions. Uh, as I imagine, uh, members will have uh, many questions. We are going to uh, extend our time for the evening um, and do one round of five minutes per member. Uh, that will include your questions and the responses from the panelists. Uh, as as it goes without saying, you don't have to use all five minutes, but I did want to offer that time as I know this is an important area of discussion for the, the board. Uh, so with that, uh, Ms. Young, let's begin with you. Thank you. One moment. Okay, thank you for uh, putting this slide deck up. Um, again, hello everyone. My name is Rashida Young. I am Chief School Performance Officer at the DC Public Charter School Board. So I'm going to dive right in. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so as, as some of you may have heard, we uh, at the Public Charter School Board are in the process of revising our accountability framework. And we really started this work looking at our new mission. Uh, and so to begin this conversation, I wanna highlight this new mission uh, because this is the the, the, really the foundation of the changes. I bolded the particular area that sta stands out as we make uh, changes to the framework. So DCPCSB has an overall focus on making sure all students are thriving, including those uh, historically marginalized. So for our accountability work, we really want to 
uh, keep this group in mind um, and keep equity and academics at the forefront of our framework. Next slide. So the primary purpose of PCSB's new accountability system is for our board to make school oversight decisions. This includes decisions related to goals determination for schools that use the framework as their goals and other decisions such as decisions on expansion or if the school perhaps needs a letter of good standing. Uh, at the same time, the framework is used as a mechanism to communicate school performance with uh, various communities and we also know that parents use the tool to inform decisions on school choice, among other tools that are available in the city. Next slide. So uh, this just shows some of the prior engagement and collaboration that we've done over the past year. Uh, we really started uh, last winter disseminating a survey to school leaders and other members of the community. We had a series of small group sessions with LEAs to gather feedback. Uh, we were doing monthly meetings with Mathematica and its regional educational laboratory to help us with research on new measures. Um, we've had school leader meetings and have also discussed this publicly with our board. So we've tried to gather as many inputs as possible. Next slide. So the biggest change from our current framework, the performance management framework or PMF, and what we are proposing in our revised framework is that all measures will be disaggregated by student group performance. Um, we're starting this as the basis of our work. We also want to explore using special education level by category or classification. Um, and we also know that there, there are student group intersections that may, um, that, that may be important for us to explore, such as at-risk students who also have a disability. Uh, even if we can't publicly display that information because of end size um, or other parameters, we do at least wanna make the data available for internal reports um, available to schools. But again, these are the uh, some of the student groups that will be highlighted that, that we have not highlighted in the past. Next slide. So we have landed on these three categories. Um, the, uh, the categories are school performance, school progress, and school environment. Um, and while those names are, are rather similar to what we have in our PMF, um, one main difference is that we are planning to have a rating for each of those categories in addition to an overall summative rating so that stakeholders will be able to see more clearly where the school is excelling and where there are still areas of growth. Next slide. So these are the proposed school performance measures. Um, there, it, it is a long list. Uh, on the left, you'll see the current PMF and on the right, you'll see those measures that are under consideration. Um, the, the work we're doing this year is to whittle this list down. It will not include everything, but this is what our staff and schools are exploring this school year. Um, one difference you might notice is that uh, on the PMF, we assign points for Park 3 plus as well as 4 and 5 plus, whereas this framework only um, considers 4 and 5 plus. Uh, also for school environment, um, we have a number of um, measures. Some are a part of the PMF, some are new. Uh, there are other measures that could pop back in to be on the table. For example, a school survey, that was something we explored in the spring, it was taken off the table. If at some point the city adopted um, a citywide survey in future years, that could be something we consider again. Next slide. Um, for the high school framework, there are a lot of measures that were originally in the gateway category that are now just going to be in the overall school performance category. We've also um, taken the time to combine some measures that have had a duplicative story to tell. For example, the data we received from SAT and PSAT are relatively the same, so um, we're considering combining those measures. Next slide. And these are the proposed measures for the adult education framework. Um, one change that you'll see here, we plan on exploring, ex, uh, we plan to explore expanding CTE. For example, possibly including a digital literacy as part of CTE. Um, we'd also like to consider having an engagement measure. 
uh, as opposed to just attendance, although at this time we have not yet uh, defined what engagement would be. If we cannot land on a definition in business rules, we would continue using attendance. Um, we do not have proposed measures for our alternative schools. For now, we really want to get the framework right for our traditional and adult schools, and then we'll assess whether it's appropriate for our, our alternative schools. We just did a business rule goals revamp with our alt schools in 2020, and so for now, those will remain in place. Uh, so uh, that is the last slide, I believe, um, and I'm happy to answer. Oh, I'm sorry, it is not the last slide. Uh, the last slide, just uh, to give a, a snippet of for future engagement, um, we are in it, we are having advisory groups with our schools and our staff to walk through what the business rules of these proposed measures could be. Our goal is that by May 2022, we'd have a, a pilot technical guide uh, presented to our board. Then next school year, we will continue engagement with advisory groups in a task force meeting to really set the floors and targets of these measures um, that would also ultimately allow us to see what the weights and how the scoring would work out. And then uh, by May of 2023, we would have a full technical guide open for public comment. And then this framework, our hope is to have it in uh, full Im implementation by school year 23-24. So we still are a long way out from having a complete framework. And given the uncertainty of um, COVID-19 and schools still getting back into the swing of things, we think that the long runway is, is appropriate and we're going to take our time to make sure that we get these changes right. And uh, that is all I'll share for now. Happy to answer questions at a later time. Thank you. Um, next, we will go uh, to Mr. Mizrov. All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. It's good to see you. I think it's been several years since I've been with the board. I used to come here a lot when I was with ANSI, so it's good to see you all again, and thank you for inviting me. Um, am I showing my slide, or are you going to show it for me? Um, okay, there you go. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm here to talk about a paper that was published in Educational Policy uh, this summer in July, um, and the paper, I think, relates to the topics that you're talking about today. Um, my work, my research is guided by uh, the saying, every program is perfectly tailored to get the results it gets. And the results that we get um, in Washington, D.C. and nationally are results of, unfortunately, uh, severe um, achievement gaps in school segregation. And my interest is in how do we create that? What's interesting, interesting I think, about segregation is that segregation is on the rise today and is happening within diverse neighborhoods too. So it's hard for us to put the blame on the history of school segregation pre-Brown or on housing, um, housing issues that usually people refer to when they talk about school segregation. We wanna look inwards at the educational policies and practices that drive those outcomes. Um, the model that uh, is presented here is an attempt to do that. And it shows a connection between three seemingly distinct policy processes that I believe are well connected. The first is the way we initially segregate students through current day policies and practices. Those would include areas of unequal school choice, opening charter schools, for example, in already segregated neighborhoods, uh, difficult application processes, instances where cho schools choose kids instead of kids choosing schools. And of course, when we're opening um, choice, uh, there is well-documented phenomena of white parents choosing to self-segregate. After we, re we initially segregate uh, the students, the second component is that we, we discriminate those schools that enroll predominantly uh, historically marginalized group. We do so by providing them with inequitable budgeting and support. Uh, they don't have access to the type of PTA money. They don't have access to the types of programs that are funded in other schools. And most importantly, there's inequitable access to the most important resource, which is a great teachers. Our best teacher, the great art teachers that just graduated from American University is gonna go to the school with an established arts program and an auction at the end of the year, the school that serves more affluent population. Those schools also have more experienced teachers, which creates a pay gap where we put more money and teachers pay uh, for affluent schools. Those are two processes that were discussed in research for a very long time. Uh, but I'm suggesting to add a third one, the process of discriminatory signaling policy, where after we segregate, 
and then discriminate. We go and say, this is a bad school, this is a good school. And we do it using an unfair school evaluation and rating, evaluation and rating that are based on standardized tests and proficiency measures that measure mostly who you teach and not how you teach. These are measures that um, were documented in research by having a disproportionately negative impact on schools serving predominantly black students. Uh, schools that choose to take kids that um, are, have a different starting point um, take on themselves the reality of having a lower rating. And that may have results in terms of other parents choosing to send their kids to their schools. I'd like to quickly touch on a misconception that we have around the DC accountability system. It is a heavily proficiency-based system. Some people think that proficiency and growth in the DC system are somehow balanced. Proficiency and growth are methods, they're not measures. And you can apply growth or proficiency for every single measure that we have. Uh, there's only one measure out of several, five or six that has the growth component, that's the, that's the achievement in tests. It is insignificant compared to the other measures. So the DC system gives five stars to those schools that enroll students that are already doing well because it has predominantly these proficiency measures. It creates this scale of some research called scale of whiteness because some of those schools that are get those lower ratings, they have to invest more in math and reading and they change their curriculum and they remove uh, music and arts. And, um, and that's a signal that, that, we're, that we're sending back. I'll finish by uh, quoting from the paper and then uh, we can go to questions because I obviously cannot sum up the paper in five minutes. The signaling process explains a multi-directional causation process portrayed by the SDS triangle. Signaling serves as a mediating factor wherein schools that are initially segregated through exclusionary enrollment are then rated as inferior by the school system based on standardized testing and proficiency measurements, thus exacerbating the existing segregation. Discrimination in resources lead to poorer performance, which is then communicated to parents via proficiency-based ratings, ultimately allowing more affluent, predominantly white parents to use open choice systems and opt out of poorly rated neighborhood schools, predominantly serving students of color. Uh, I'll end with that and I can take the questions later. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Next. Oh, okay, I see. Next, I'm gonna uh, call on Mr. Simmons. I didn't see you. That's why I was looking uh, in the Brady Bunch boxes. Uh, you are up next. Thanks uh, uh, to all the board. Um, it's good to be here and see many of you. Uh, I'm glad you're uh, as safe as possible. Uh, in September 1997, I walked into Drew Middle School in the Detroit Public Schools to begin my professional journey as a teacher. I taught in my neighborhood. I taught those who look like me. I taught the next generation of leaders and revolutionaries. I must return to that place when I think about accountability because I must ground my analysis, not simply as a scholar and not simply as an educator, I ground my analysis in kids, but more specifically, I ground my analysis in the black, brown and indigenous children that far too many in education and society have deemed disposable and question their humanity. Having served as the chief of innovation and research in DCPS and as the CEO of the See Forever Foundation and the Maya Angelou Public Charter Schools, I'm acutely aware of the various ways that accountability tools and the associated analysis are used in punitive ways. At moments, I find my involvement in this discussion to be antithetical to my belief system as someone who utilized critical race theory as a theoretical framework in my dissertation and for most of my writing as an academic and researcher. At other moments, I find the various accountability instruments nationally, the STAR framework in DC included, to be deeply problematic because they lack the ability to tell the human story of what actually happens in schools, in the lives of students, and in the lives of teachers and school leaders. Furthermore, as a teacher who was nominated twice as National Teacher of the Year, I actually find it offensive that far too many people who design these instruments make judgments of the results, have never picked up a piece of chalk and had the experience of teaching a young person amidst pain, triumph, and challenge. When one looks at the results of the STAR framework, it is apparent based on this instrument that all children in the District of Columbia aren't receiving the same education. I will avoid offering a critique of how we describe those children as at risk or even the misplaced usage of the term in DC policy and school budgeting, but instead want to suggest that the intention of the STAR framework is actually good. 
As a teacher of black children who must fight daily against a deficit narrative about their humanity, I do want them to attend schools where they have opportunities to succeed academically, but also have their blackness embraced, loved, and nurtured. I am by no means a psychometrician, but I am a critical race theorist who studies the ways in which race and racism influences our decision-making, application of data, and the ways in which data is weaponized to create the same system of oppression that many, many quote unquote allies claim to be fighting against. Now I wanna be clear, I don't wanna tie this analysis or my remarks to the race of those making decisions or those using the STAR framework because skin folks ain't always kin folks. With that said, it is my assertion that the STAR framework is inadequate as currently constructed for schools and teachers and school leaders for that matter to counteract the negative public perception the narrative of failure produces. Furthermore, I would argue that we take some time to do some root cause analysis, which the STAR framework and many other frameworks in the District of Columbia, Columbia aren't actually built to do of why school failure is more normative in communities serving black, brown, and indigenous young folks. Certainly, we don't believe that these kings and queens in places like Ward 7 and Ward 8 are any less scholarly than their white peers in other parts of the city. The sad reality is that the narrative associated with failure, as measured by the current iteration of the STAR framework, along with other racist ideologies and behaviors, does lead some in Washington, D.C. to traffic in the deficit narrative of children, and their families in Ward 7 and Ward 8 in particular. I am not here to suggest you toss out the STAR framework. I'm here to suggest it be revised and include the voices of those who do the hard work of teaching kids and loving them through tragedy and triumph. Additionally, I am recommending that the framework take time to include qualitative data and bring on those who value qualitative data, not simply usage of quantitative data because of its expediency and analysis. In closing, I'll leave you with this. Some of my critical race theory colleagues and I have suggested that schools and urban communities aren't actually failing, but simply producing the intended outcome. Is this true in Washington, DC? And does the STAR framework help us counter that assertion. Lastly, I pose this to you, the board and the community. Why are we here? Are we looking to build an instrument that supports learning, but also children, teachers, and administrators? Or are we looking to build an instrument that is easy to use, convenient to implement, but also fosters a narrative that allows certain parts of the community to question the humanity of children, and their families in neighborhoods marginalized by economics, gentrification, and food apartheid. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, uh, we are going to again have five minute rounds. Please raise your hand. I will go in the order that I see hands on uh, the panel. And first up we have Representative O'Leary. You're muted, Representative O'Leary. Five minutes, wow. Uh, I, I, I'm gonna go backwards in my questions. I've got questions for all three of the panelists, but I, but I wanna start with Dr. Simmons and um, just ditto everything he said. Uh, I have a couple of questions. You mentioned chalk. Um, I think you and I might be the only people that know what chalk was. Um, Fair enough. <laughs> and you also mentioned about uh, hiding behind, I put down hiding behind race. Mm -hmm. the, the problem with decision makers is that they um, forget, forget their race sometimes. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned intended in outcomes. Mm -hmm. I taught for, I'm still teaching. So I've been teaching for now over 50 years in, in DC public schools and, and the University of the District of Columbia. And 
I've never thought that my students couldn't do something. And I don't think there are many teachers that feel that way, that their students couldn't do something. But I know that most of my students, when they came into my class, were not reading, I teach English, reading at a grade level, at the grade level that they were in. And the star and the evaluation system, especially the park, doesn't allow for any kind of growth to be shown. Because if a student came to my class reading at a fifth grade level and he, and he or she was a senior in high school, and by the end of the year, that student was reading at a ninth grade level, a four grade jump in one year, they were still looked as a failure as far as uh, the, the frameworks were concerned. So I, I, don't, I don't think the park test is a valid uh, metric for anything. Uh, that's how I feel. And I, uh, I think that until we recognize in the city that there are many more ways to show how a student grows than one standardized test that is not uh, fair to our students to begin with and is very unfair to the students to end with. So I wanna appreciate what you had to say I'd like to follow up with you at some point if I can get your information. I'll get your information. Absolutely. Um, Ms. Young, when you had that, sur you mentioned the survey that y'all took. Did you, um, what percentage of uh, the respondents uh, were the percentages of, uh, how many people uh, responded to the survey per percentage wise? I don't have that number in front of me. I you have a ballpark? Definitely... I don't have a ballpark. My my team is not the one that aggregated all of the answers. We looked at all of the trends, takeaways, because there were various surveys based on school leaders, their staff, community members, our board. It was a it was pretty comprehensive. So I don't have specific numbers in front of me for the survey. But the community was also surveyed, right? Yes, we took so some of the survey went to families. Um, again, I would have to find out specific numbers at another. Was it a, was it a paper survey or an online survey? It was online. Okay, I, I'm asking all of that because one of the problems that we've had over the pandemic is all the information is being put out online, assuming that everyone who's a parent in the city knows how to work online. And I think that's an incorrect assumption. Uh, I'm not. I'm not saying anything about your survey. I just. It just to me make doesn't. You know. You have to touch the people to find out what they think. I think. Um, how else uh, do you show growth in the in the charter schools besides the park? So one um, one thing that we are considering having is a school selected. Uh, growth assessment. Most of our schools use NWEA MAP or iReady. A handful use others, but we have been talking about this in our advisory groups with LEAs of whether those assessments should be part of a scored, um, part of a scored framework, part of the display only. Um, there are a number of schools that feel that that those assessments capture growth much better than Park. So that is something that we're exploring all this year. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm out of my time. Thank you, uh, Representative Sutter. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Simmons, Ms. Young, and Mr. Mizrav for your presentations tonight. Um, I'm going to also start with Dr. Simmons. Um, I'm curious about the way you describe the system that we should strive for, one that supports children, that supports schools in growth. I had the chance to present our STAR framework presentation to the Ward 6 Public School Parent Organization last night, and a very kind mom asked me at the end what I would do if I had my druthers, and I said, I think we should blow the whole thing up. I think we should start again in a two-year data deficit and say, what would it look like if we built a system from scratch? So I'm soliciting ideas. What would you build as a system that might actually both provide information, qualitative and quantitative, but be supportive? What kind of things would you see in there? I mean, I think the first thing is equal parts quantitative, but equal parts qualitative, but also paying attention to what psychometricians say, right? Like psychometricians tell us 
stop using standardized test measurements as the single measure of teacher ability, right? Like, and how successful teachers are, right? So that's thinking about other things. And I think the addiction to that type of stuff, to be real frank, is connected to the funding mechanism mechanism of Pearson and their influence in public education. Like we have to stop that, right? And we have to actually do what's in the best interest of kids and, and like that whole thing. The second piece is that the information that comes from a lot of these things, like speaking strictly technically, when it comes to schools, if it's coming at the end of the year and the kids are gone, what do you do with it? Like what happens, right? It's, it's a summative assessment that doesn't allow you to make course corrections in the middle of the, of the year, right? So it's just deeply problematic. And the third thing is that the, the ability to make the changes that come from whatever framework has to happen, you also have to change other things, not simply this framework. For example, if kids move, and I'm not going to share nobody's business in the city, right? After count day, those kids that are quote unquote problem kids, they don't stay at some of these schools and they end up at schools like my Angelou Public Charter School with no money. No money follows them because the money doesn't follow kids. So if you change the framework, you also have to change funding mechanisms. You also have to change accountability around schools actually having um, a diverse teaching force, right? PCSB and ICE, they don't even require you to report that. Like, why are we just now disaggregating data by race? That's absurd. That, that's, that's actually a fundamental principle that goes against being anti-racist. Um, so I think that there are things that we can do, uh, but those are the three that I would uh, suggest. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. I appreciate it. And I know we'll be following up on, on more of that with you. Um, Ms. Young, I just wanted to create, uh, sort of thank PCSB for the long cycle of engagement you guys are working with. So starting at the early January frame, uh, time frame when you began the engagement to fully implementing in 2023, 2024. I also want to just ask a question around how you treat the sort of iterative process of getting feedback as you finalize a new framework, because that seemed present in your timeline. I want to understand more about that. Right. So it, it certainly is iterative. The first step was coming up with the universe of measures that we wanted on the table. After our engagement sessions with schools in the spring, of which we had 25 sessions with almost all of the LEAs, we had a much larger list than what I presented tonight. That's because between then and now, we worked with Mathematica uh, and our own staff to really drill down to which measures we wanted to explore this year um, in terms of looking at business rules. Then once we start collecting data this summer and start modeling out what would a framework look like with these measures in place, we might come to different takeaways. We might find that two measures tell the same story and do we really need both or two measures tell a conflicting story. So which one is the truer story? Um, we also, uh, there's been conversation tonight about qualitative uh, information. What I shared with you was more of the quantitative. Overall, we, we plan to have more of a dashboard approach with this framework so that in addition to the quantitative measures that you could see on one tab of the dashboard, we would also have other tabs that provide more information on more qualitative information so that this is simply a one-stop shop for where do I find out information about schools? Some of the qualitative, you cannot measure fairly between one school or another, but it might be something that stakeholders want to know about the school. Uh, for example, site visits. Um, so that's another part of the iteration is what deserves, um, not what deserves, what should be in the framework and scored and what is um, not feasible to be scored and compared, but still tells information about a school that we want included in the dashboard. Great, thank you. I'm over my time. Mr. Mizrav, I'll put a comment for you in the chat. Uh, next up is Representative Reed. Good evening. Um, Representative Sutter took my question, but because I took the time to write it down, um, and this tweet has been um, playing in the back of my mind, I'll just go ahead and um, throw it out there. Um, and even Mr. or Dr. Simmons wants to provide 
additional information or just ditto what you had. And then I also have a question for uh, Ms. Young. Um, so um, Dr. Nicole Hannah-Jones, who of course was distinguished faculty at UNC, moved over to Howard because of tenure issues. Um, tweeted something last week that says, why not just rank the schools by wealth and stop wasting everyone's time? Um, and that's like resonated with me because as we're doing this work, I fear that elements of capitalism and racism, we're just gonna remix and figure out a way to get those elements back in. Um, and so I was wondering how, I am starting to get to the point that I'm like, we have information on the back end um, to help schools um, in regards to how parents are selecting schools, we can still figure that out, even though my hunch a lot of it is word of mouth and branding and other things that are going on. Um, but anywho, if we have to, under federal constraints, we have to create this system. Um, so how do we prevent some of that from happening? And feel free to say I already answered that, but I just wanted to kind of throw out there, I'm, I'm getting tired of remixing the same stuff over. Yeah, it's nothing like a good uh, remix. Um, I prefer the the remix of Mary J. Blige and uh, Method Man myself of their classic hip hop hit, but I'll refrain from bringing hip hop into the public space for now. Um, although a course on hip hop would do us well in the District of Columbia, but that's neither here nor there. Um, I think, you know, the. The, the connection to capitalism and education is something people don't like to talk about, right? Like, and I think that whether we read the work of, uh, of uh, Pauline Lippman and her critique of, of the, the, the ways in which they use the Renaissance, whatever it was, framework in Chicago, uh, the work of Henry Giroux and others, um, and uh, Kenneth Saltman and his critique of the portfolio district um, in places like um, New Orleans, I think separating money from education is part of the doing the root cause analysis, right? Um, and, and I think people have written about this, but we oftentimes in education, we ignore those folks and we retreat to the people who are safest, right? The research institutions that give us cover to continue to put forward a, a neoliberal agenda, right? And, and like it provides protection for the neoliberal reform stuff that hasn't worked. Um, and so I think, <laughs> you know, the ranking system aligns with economics. That's just a key element of this that has to be acknowledged. But it also requires asking, does the actual lottery system actually reproduce that same oppression along economic lines as well? Right. So, again, you change the star framework, but you also have to change these other things too. Like it can't just be this over here and that over there just stays the same or else you're just gonna get the same outcomes, right? And so I think that it's important to keep in mind uh, to Brother, uh, Brother Mizrab's uh, point, like the, the ways in which all of this is connected is super important and you can't do all of this in isolation and, and quite frankly, and I'll say it and it'll probably get me in trouble, but it's intellectually lazy to do that, right? When you just do things in isolation and don't do the hard work of doing root cause analysis and like we become the oppressor amidst an oppressive system when we do that. Um, and so I'll stop there um, in, as it relates to that, but definitely uh, want to shout out uh, any, any mention of a remix always gets me excited as a hip hop head. I'm gonna to try to get this question in uh, for Miss Young. Um, and I'm not coming at you, so don't take it that way. But it, I just have to, it's something I'm back in my mind in regards to a conversation that I had with the community um, ec uh, education kind of activist who mentioned like his sentiments that felt like the original or the current PMF is a little easier than like star rate or some other rating system. Um, and I see you're doing a, uh, uh, an update of that. So, I don't know if you want to put in chat or um, can you help me with that? I'm not sure where that's coming from, but I, it's just in my back of my mind. Um, I mean, part of one of the reasons, one of the ways in which we're changing our framework is also, and I didn't include this, creating four categories so that we can better tease out how one school is doing to the next. We had a system where we had schools in tier one, schools, a huge number in tier two, and if you were high tier two or low tier two, there was a lot of nuance in that and in our framework um, wasn't set up to, to tease out that nuance. So 
part of this revamp will include having um, an additional category to better communicate to the public how that school is doing. Thank you for that. And I probably just need to circle with you one-on-one, -on -one, um, but thanks. Thank you. Uh, Representative Patterson. Thank you. Um, this question is directed at uh, Ms. Young. Um, really appreciate, because I'm the representative from this uh, state board on the advisory framework that you're doing right now. But I want to go back to the survey that you mentioned and ask how or did you guys collaborate once you guys are going through that survey with OSSI and with the State Board of Education? A lot of the narrative is, is that we basically have two different systems um, and a lot of things are done kind of like in vacuums without really, you know, cross sector kind of collaborations. So can you tell me how that if if there was some collaboration, so to speak, or um, support from each other on that when you did that survey? Sure. So the survey was really to get a, a lay of the land of measures. Um, what about the PMF is working? What did stakeholders say is not working or is not helpful? For OSSI, um, one of the big pieces of collaboration will be in business rules. Right now, not all of our business rules align between the PMF and the STAR. And so it, it may feel to families and others that there are two truths to a certain measure. So we've been in communication with Aussie for a long time, assuring that both sides want to uh, have aligned business rules. So I would say that is where our collaboration is. It is early in the process for us to align on that because we're not yet in pilot phase, um, but it's something that our teams are certainly um, in communication about. As for the state board, um, mm -hmm. I am open to ways in which we can best inform you as we go through this you know, two year revamp. Um, being here tonight is part of our, uh, our nod to wanting to make sure that this is transparent for, for everyone here in the city. But if I understand your answer, in that previous survey that you mentioned, there was not that same type of collaboration. Is that correct? That there, there wasn't like a representative or they didn't talk about what the questions would look like with the state board or with the OSSI. They did the survey and then kind of like tease that out to the LEAs, the charter LEAs. Um, I, what I can say definitively is that the survey was sent to LEAs, community members, staff of the schools, I would have to ask my team who slash how many specifically from OSSI or the state board or other government bodies received it. Um, that's just not my, that's not my wheelhouse. So I don't, I can't give you that information right on the spot because I just, I don't know, but I can find and out. I, and I appreciate that, um, Rashida, because I know I've worked with you a lot and stuff like that. Just trying to create that, that area where we are collaborating because that narrative is so bad about there's two education systems, basically. We got two different type of frameworks currently that we're both working on. And we need to make sure that we're working a lot smarter than harder and really trying to come to something that our parents can truly use to hold um, systems accountable. Um, so that's why I'm asking that question, but I really appreciate your, your answers. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, uh, Representative Chang. Thank you, President Parker. Thank you, panelists. Um, I will turn to you first, uh, Mr. Simmons. Um, thank you for your for your testimony. I, I I'm curious, based on what you've seen, which school districts you think we should be looking at as a model, um, and who who is doing this well? I mean, I I think. Um, and this is where I always say to folks, I'm agnostic about district or charter because in mass, none of them are serving black, brown and indigenous children well, right? It's just a broken system, right? Like it, it doesn't matter, right? And so I think in pockets, yes. I, I have found that to build a system that works best, you gotta pull from the pieces that are working well and piece it all together. Cause I don't, I've never seen a system in mass in any urban community where the entire thing is working and well. What if you just focus in on accountability as pockets. Are there any school districts that do- I mean, but my pushback would be, in, but you have to focus on the whole thing in order for accountability to actually be reasonable and rational. Because if not, 
to like you're then going to have this whole thing around like test scores and then you're going to like it inevitably has schools that experience high poverty at the bottom of the ranking system every time like it doesn't it doesn't matter now if you were to go with a system an accountability system that is working well i've not seen one that works well right which you. to your colleagues point i think crashing and burning stuff when it comes to things like that if we've been doing it this way for so long i i think it makes sense to start over but i also think in the district of columbia having two different measurement systems from PCSB and, and, and DCPS makes it even more problematic for parents to actually make decisions because it's not actually comparing the same thing. Well, so I, I think I, I that think there I has to be one system. Make sure that there's a distinction between accountability and communication to parents around school choice, right? That that the, the way that we communicate to schools, this is, and this was our last panel that, that our panelists mm -hmm. corrected me on, Right, uh, DCOSVOE members, uh, that accountability, the audience for accountability is not parents, is what, what the folks from the, uh, the last panel said to me, right? But, but, um, but my point is that schools use accountability and weaponize it as a communication tool to parents. That may not be what it's intended to do, but that's how they use it to get butts in seats because the money doesn't follow kids. It's a part of a capitalistic design of education, right? And so I disagree with you in that, like it is used by schools to communicate quote unquote success, which then draws kids because of school choice from one part of the city to the next or to, the, uh, to another because parents are chasing that best school, right? And so I'm not disagreeing with your point that maybe that's not what it's intended to do, but in order to chase the carrot of enrollment and budget and things like that, schools are forced to use it that way because that is a key driver of strategic communications and marketing. Yeah. Mr. Mizroff, do you have do you have a system that you would turn to and, and recommend that we look at? Well, I think one of the things to remember is sometimes the process is even more important than the outcome. Uh, the, a good system is a system that utilizes community input in a genuine way. Uh, so rather than prescribing you a single system that I would say that is the system that we should use, we should utilize our community and hear from people who go to these schools and from the teachers who teach in these schools, what would be a proper way to measure their work and what, what, what is a high quality school in Washington, D.C. I would uh, point you to the paper and in the end of the paper is a section called recommendations to policymakers that includes uh, suggestions on a good uh, accountability system. Um, as far as the um, combination of proficiency and growth measures, my, um, my proposed uh, weight would be 0% proficiency and 100% growth. Growth is what schools do between the time that the kid come into the school and the time that they leave uh, the, the school. And proficiency is what happens outside. Uh, Thank you. I, I have 10 seconds left, and I just want to confirm that this is right. Basically, what I'm hearing, though, from the two of you is if we change the system, that we would be, as, as a DC district, paving the path forward for something better, not necessarily that you see a, a model out there that we could be replicating. Is that correct? I think I, I don't that's correct. I think there are models and I'm happy to share some examples. I think there are models that you could look at. First, DC is much more heavyweight and proficiency than other states. I think there are models that you could look at, but I would say that wouldn't be enough. That wouldn't be a replacement for a community for a community uh, voice in, in the design. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Wattenberg. Um, yeah, thank you all. This has been uh, terrific. Um, I have loved hearing all three of you. Um, we do not, unfortunately, have the ability that we all want to uh, crash and burn this system. I actually was on the board when we adopted it. I tried, I failed. Here we are. What we do have the opportunity to do, however, is to make recommendations to Aussie, to push those uh, recommendations out to, around the city about what we think should happen that would greatly um, alter this. And I want to say, per um, uh, Representative Patterson is, is uh, uh, 
in and out of here. I see he, he's on. One thing that he has talked to us about a lot, and we've tried to um, push in our committee, we are the co-chairs of the committee dealing with this, is that we want um, something that meets the law, that uh, fits the federal requirements, but that really puts us in a position to be able to steer the right resources to the right places. Um, and we want to develop something. Um, so with, with, with that, and, and we wanted to, so we want to, in rethinking this and reimagining this, we're talking about how do we provide the information that um, allows for that kind of targeting to provide the information that parents want to the point others have made and to do it in a way uh, that isn't uh, damaging to the kids or to the schools and to, um, yeah, and to do it in a way that's not biased, to do it in a way that is more accurate about the quality of the schools. Given all of that, um, my question to uh, Mr. Mizrov and Dr. Simmons is how, one of the things that we have looked at is to provide the data, but not provide the rating. In other words, let's say what the growth is, let's say what the proficiency is, and let's look at some of this qualitative stuff. What, what's going on in the classroom? How do people feel about it? Do kids feel like they're being challenged? Do teachers feel like they're getting support? And then um, provide the information, but don't provide the rating, ranking, which is a lot of what contributes to this narrative. So let me start with Mr. Mizrov, you, um, and then go to Dr. Simmons. And then if I have time, I'm going to go to Rashida with a different question. Sure. So um Board member Wattenberg, schools are not hotels. And here's what happens with the system that, that, that we've created. When, when the principal of Cardozo High School is going to choose to take a student immigrant in a 12th grade age that cannot graduate on time and choose to take that student in the school and help them graduate in three, four years, that principal is going to be penalized by Washington, D.C. with a lower star rating. And the parents in that gentrifying neighborhood, now diverse neighborhood around Cardozo, are going to continue to vote with their feet you know, to send their kids to other schools. And you have that anomaly of, a, of, of an exclusively um, non-white school or minority school or almost predominantly black school in, in a gentrifying neighborhood, a segregated school in an integrated neighborhood. And if a principal of, doesn't matter, traditional public or public charter school, go to a kid that would not do well on the test, and will tell his single mom that has three jobs, this, this, this school is a bad fit for your, for your child. That principal is going to be rewarded by a higher star rating by, from the DC government. And that way we connect that signaling system to that segregation. If we would be able, uh, the optimistic piece here is that you're talking about a way to put a pin in that process, to change that process, to improve outcomes. And I think by creating a system that is more nuanced, like the one you're, you're, you're suggesting, that is not saying bad school, right? But it's saying, okay, this school may need to improve, you know, some, some, some reading outcomes for some students. But look, that school is doing well for students with disabilities. We All right. don't I'm know gonna, that. I'm going to stop you because yeah. I want to go to Dr. Sim yes. Sim so what you. I'm picking up is information good, ranking, rating. If we can get rid of that, maybe we should do that. Fair? Okay, Dr. Simmons? Yeah, I mean, I, I think to, to follow up on his point, I think that uh, there's the nuance of it all that is important, but also this idea that schools need to be, be provided with the resources that they need um, to actually effectuate the change that uh, they're being expected to make uh, to be made. Right. And I think that the resources to his point around the, the principal who doesn't who takes that student at Cardozo, the flip side is the principal who takes that student in the middle of the year gets the per pupil and then kicks them out right after uh, count day, and then the money doesn't go to the school that they are at, right? And so I, I think that that is part of what has to happen is that mechanism has to change. And most of these frameworks, uh, whether it's uh, STAR, PCSB, ROP, whatever we want to call it, the, uh, they don't account for that, right? And I think that that penalizes in particular um, school dis schools in uh, Representative uh, Thompson and Representative Reed's wards in Ward 7 and Ward 8. Um, and, and I think that it just becomes deeply uh, problematic because it also makes it harder for schools in those parts of the city to effectuate change because the resources um, either never show up or they leave at critical moments um, or uh, those kids, those schools receive 
uh, young people after the uh, after count day. And I'm going to I'm going to cut you off because nobody else is, but I'm way, way over time. But if there's okay. a set round, I'm, I'm coming back and uh, uh, same to Ms. Young. Thank you, Representative. Uh, panelists receive more grace uh, than members uh, with that uh, representative. Oh, could he finish then? Because I'd be very happy to hear. Uh, um, Mr. Simmons, yes, feel free to finish your point. Then we're going to go to Mr. Thompson, uh, Ms. Uh, Representative Thompson. Uh, what about Zach, the I, I'm closer to I'm closer to 50 after my last trip around okay. the sun, so I can't really remember where I was going with that. Understood. Understood. It's too well, long between my thought and the pause, like I lose track of time. So I, I, I'm still struggling to remember the names of my two sons some days. So uh, I'm I'm just I'm just trying to make it, brother. No, it's all good. It's all good. Uh, Representative Thompson. I'm pretty sure Representative Gasoy was next. She's asked that you go first. Okay, sure. Uh, thanks, Rep. Gasoy. Uh, my question, which I think any of the panelists can answer, uh, since we are at a point as a board where one of our committees is taking up revisiting the STAR framework, uh, and I heard um, uh, I think it was Mr. Mizrov say, a good system is one that takes the input uh, of the people it serves. If there, if you all have recommendations uh, for engaging people who are not necessarily spending all of their time thinking about accountability uh, and how we might get their input. And that's for anyone. Uh, well, I can start. I, I was actually waiting to hear from you, Dr. Simmons, because I'm curious what, what, what your thoughts are on that. But um, um, I, I would start with the teachers and the parents that go to the schools and talk to them about what they like or don't like about their schools and see what measures these people that don't speak the language of school accountability come up with when we're asking them the question, what do you like about your school? Start with seeing what measures do they do they, do they speak to? Do they talk about the engagement with the teacher? Do they talk about the quality of instruction? Do they talk about the uh, family engagement practices of the school principal? Uh, let's start with that. And, um, and let's try to, to, to be genuine when we're trying to engage with them. Because a lot of the times we're, we're, we're coming up with a system, I'm speaking hypothetically, even though I have some experience in this, uh, in this policy making process in DC, a lot of times we're already coming up with a system that we want to have. And then we're saying, meet us at the Anacostia Library at 9 p.m. on Tuesday for community engagement. And we get the, the, the responses and then you know we make or don't make the changes that we make. That's a different process from going for going to teachers and parents and speaking and, 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 and you know engaging with them around what, what is a good and what is a not so good school in Washington, DC. Yeah, I mean I I would start there as well. Um, in my experience, um, the the families and young folks will lead us, right? And I think all you have to do is look at the Blackburn takeover to see what young people will do for justice, right? Young people will tell you what's wrong. They will oftentimes tell you what's right. And I also think when I think of young people, I think of turning to, to teachers, right? And figuring out how do you bring teachers together to offer feedback on what makes sense? I don't know of any teacher in my network who would say teachers should not be held accountable for students. Now, what that looks like, um, to his point around proficiency versus growth is where the rubber hits the road. Um, and, and the last thing I think has to happen is that in order to do it, what's the right mechanism to collect the information? Because in order to do that information, to do that type of work at a very deep level, you have to actually sit and talk to people. Like you can't you can't do surveys. You can't like say like, well, let's send out a poll via email. You actually have to talk to people to understand the human condition. That's just how this works, right? Um, and I think the last thing is um, really engaging with a community engagement model uh, that can be looked at from uh, work that's been done um, at Harvard and other places that allows you to collect the information 
um, as a team of people and as a community and make decisions based on that information. Um, and, and I think that that's super important um, and use food as a carrot to get people there. Like you have to have a carrot to get people to show up to these things, especially now when we know what's going on with the pandemic and everything around the racial reckoning that we've uh, continued to experience. Ms. Young, I'm curious if you had any thoughts given that. Um, yeah, one thing I wanna add is that we did have exam um, instances in which there was conflicting guidance perhaps by the same school. And that is because schools want the measures that are working for them to help inform their instruction to be kept pure. And there were some instances in which there was concern that if this you know, family environment survey or this, um, uh, this, this school selected assessment, if this makes its way into a high stakes accountability framework that we won't be using it the same way and it won't have the same meaning and be able to guide instruction the same way. So some of the conversations we had with the schools one, one on one or three on one, the things that they were suggesting measured their school best months later after reflecting, those same schools did not want those in the accountability framework because they wanted to make sure that their use remained pure and that they didn't um, have any sort of perverse incentive not to use them the way they were intended for. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you, and I appreciate uh, your honesty. <laughs> thank you, uh, Vice President Gasoy. Thank you so much, and thank you to all the panelists, um, and thank you also to the Accountability Committee um, for bringing all of you here. Uh, it's been really interesting. So my first question actually is for you, Mr. Mizrav. Um, I really appreciated your SDS model, and I'm just wondering if you think that an, an accountability system could actually mitigate the other two policy practices that you know lead to segregation or is the best we can do to do no harm and if you know if the former what might that look like like what are some metrics we might use or change in the format um and i guess going back to representative chang's question like if there are some practices in other states that you've noted, that would be helpful as well. Yeah, so um, uh, you, you raise a very good question over what is the purpose of the accountability system? And it's not uh, often the case that the stated purpose that policymakers attribute to the accountability system is the way it actually plays out with parents and with the community. We touched on that a little bit earlier. Dr. Simmons talked about that, the difference between the, the, the intention and, 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 and the outcome. So of course, uh, policymakers may not want to segregate schools when they're, when they're designing that system. That's just the outcome. I absolutely believe that we could uh, come up with designs for accountability system that help us uh, drive the improvement that we want to drive, if that's the goal that we have. Um, it would differ in terms of the context of, of the system, but the DC context is one of school choice and one where a role of, one of the roles that schools play is creating their own student body. Uh, it's just a reality by the way they advertise, by the people they speak to, by the type of demographics that they attract, by where they decide to place their, their, their buildings. I think schools ability, you know, we have some good examples of schools that are diverse by design, some good charter schools actually, and my daughter goes to one, uh, that are diverse, diverse by design and that have created innovative practices to try and create true diversity, race and income. That could be something that could be celebrated in an accountability system that I think uh, I think would do would do fantastic. But um, I, I would go back to the comments of Dr. Simmons. I think if we would go and engage the people, the teachers, the students, and and ask them about the type of system that we want to create, I believe that the consequences of the of those types of practices is going to be one where our system is going to take a step forward. Lastly, I've pasted it in the chat uh, references to the examples resources that we can go to, to find what better systems, I think better than the DC one look like. Um, and I can share with you privately those references as well and talk to you more about that, happy to do that. Sorry, um, Mr. Simmons, um, I guess a similar question, just if there are, I, both of you mentioned uh, 
other metrics that might be more or might better capture what's happening in schools? I'm just wondering um, if there are qualitative uh, metrics that you would recommend or that you think would do a better job um, or would at least not lead to the kind of um, shaming that you've mentioned uh, that you brought up. No. Um, you know, I think that the qualitative design is based on what are you trying to solve for, right? So I think there are things that I would ask, but like, I may not be solving for the same thing that somebody else is solving for. So I want to say that first, I think in terms of like, what would I look for? I mean, one, I've never seen an actual accountability system nationally in my experience that actually effectively uses qualitative data and methodologies, right? Like I just haven't seen it um, because I think qualitative data takes a long time to collect, takes a long time to do the analysis. Um, there probably are some, uh, I just, I'm just not familiar with them. Um, I think um, what, what, what is the experience of those inside of the schools, um, staff and um, teachers in terms of, do they have the resources that they need? What are the things that you do need? Um, is a useful qualitative kind of methodology? Like if you were just to ask them that, teachers are gonna tell you what they need, right? Um, right. And I, I think, I don't think we often ask them that. In my last four seconds, can I just ask you, do you think it would be helpful to have a, uh, to not have a rating system? Hmm. I'm not gonna say that because I'm a parent. Like I, I, I do, and that's where I think I am conflicted and, and a bit of a hypocrite. Like I'm a critic of the system, but I also don't want my young people that I'm charged with loving every day in my house to go to a school that won't provide them with the love that, that they need. So I think that, uh, you know, that it's, I just think the utilization of the rating system and like the, the makeup of how you get to the rating is what's problematic. But again, I'm a bit conflicted. So um, I kind of have a middle of the road political answer of <laughs> maybe, I don't know. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move efficiently and then I'm gonna give my colleagues, representatives Wadenberg and Sutter a second round of brief questions to follow up before we get to our public comment. Um, I would appreciate uh, efficient responses. Uh, to each of you, is our current uh, rating system flawed, fundamentally flawed, yes or no? In your perspective. Yes, I believe that it's fundamentally flawed, particularly given the DC context, yes. And Dr. Simmons? Yes, fundamentally flawed. And um, Ms. Young, I'm going to ask you a slightly tailored question because the, you spoke about a different rating system. Is the decision or was the decision for the Charter Board to revamp the PMF uh, an acknowledgement that the former PMF rating system was fundamentally flawed? I think it was an acknowledgement that it worked for the time that it worked and it no longer works anymore. Um, we're in, we have, we want to highlight different things than we were trying to highlight 10 years ago. We are at a point where we want to shine the light on student groups that need to be served better. And our framework was not doing that. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Ruff, uh, Ms. Ruff, is our rating system racist? I, I would go as far as saying that the rating system exacerbates racial inequality in DC. And I will let, uh, that, that's, that's my expertise, not, not, to, not to make that value judgment. Understood. Dr. Simmons. Uh, I would echo his comments. I, I wouldn't go to f that far to say that it's racist. Um, and then uh, Ms. Young, I'm going to ask you a slightly tailored question. I saw on the revamped uh, PMF that the, the inclusion of uh, re-enrollment, I've heard from a number of charter leaders, particularly those that are serving low-income students, that that often penalizes them for students that have um, that are more transient in nature or that are being displaced 
and therefore find it harder to get to school. And so can you just speak to that and to this idea of how schools are being held accountable for pushing students out after a certain date, uh, particularly black and brown students? That's a little um, loaded sure. question. Sure, I mean, I'll start by saying that there, there are students that are exempted from the universe of who's going to be measured for re-enrollment. So, you know, for example, students that move out of state. So of course, there are a number of schools that have more challenges with students with that are in within state transient. Um, and for those schools that feel that there's there are business rules that would more fairly capture, I guess, stu- uh, parent choice, because that's ultimately what re-enrollment is capturing, then we're interested in hearing what those rules can, should consider or what should what other exemptions should be considered. We do want to align as much as possible with OSSI on measures that are both on the STAR and our framework. Um, but I'm interested in hearing from schools if they feel that there are something about our rules that are penalizing one type of school over another. I would just challenge the assumption that re-enrollment uh, represents parent choice always. Again, what I'm hearing from certain school leaders is that uh, displacement often that re-enrollment rate represents parent need. And therefore it's a challenge to get across town, for instance, for the school that I was once enrolled in. And so now I need to re-enroll to a a more convenient location. But for the sake of time, I'm gonna keep it moving. There's been a lot of discussion around the use of a dashboard and moving away from a single rating to a dashboard. Can you just quickly give your take on this? And is this something that we as a state board should entertain? And um, let Mr. uh, Mr. Mesur, I will start with you. Yes, I think I think it would. I think removing the ratings would help focus people on that dashboard. Okay, when I'm looking at the brochure and I'm seeing a name of a school two stars, even though I know everything there is to know about that system, and my wife, believe me, she knows everything there is to know because I told her about her as well. It's very hard to take your eyes off of those two stars. You know, even though, you know, I'm aware, am I going to send my kid to a two-star school? That is a very bad practice by the government. That is not going to lead to improvement, in my opinion. Take it away and invest in a dashboard with more measures. I think that's going to focus people on, on the nuanced reality that school quality is just, it's just a nuanced um, thing. Thank you. And my last 10 seconds, Dr. Simmons, I'm going to give it to you. The use of a dashboard, is it something we should entertain? Absolutely. I think a dashboard would be useful. Okay, Uh, thank you. That is my time. Um, I've gotten a request for a second round from three members. I do wanna be mindful that we do have public comment um, coming up and we wanna respect people's time. Members, if you do not need all two minutes of your time, I'm now seeing fourth member, Uh, but this is important because this is a a significant part of the board's work. And I'm gonna start with Representative Sutter uh, for your two minutes. Thank you. I'll just note that Dr. O'Leary is wondering whether the student representatives have any questions. So oh, I am sorry. Uh, student representative, I didn't see any hands, but are there any questions? I don't have any questions. I was more so listening, but I'm glad to see that our panelists support the idea of a dashboard. Um, and I'm also glad to see that uh, there's a lot of diversity in, in terms of the opinions of what would be best. But um, yeah, I've just been listening for the most part. Absolutely. Uh, Representative Sutter. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mizrav, I wanted to ask a question of you. So you noted that if we took a rating off and created just a swath of information for families to look at, uh, that that might push people to be more nuanced. What I wonder is this, I have not been yet convinced by folks' arguments that taking off the ratings will suddenly encourage white parents in integrated neighborhoods to choose the neighborhood schools that they have to to this point not chosen. What would you say in counter to that? Because I I am skeptical that simply removing a rating and providing data is going to make that shift in people's longstanding behavior around school choices. Uh, Correct. Uh, Simply removing the rating would not uh, miraculously integrate our schools. 
uh, integrating a school would require reform that goes into the root causes of school segregation. And I would start at the diverse neighborhoods because those are the places where we can most clearly see uh, what are the educational policy factors. But uh, that's not the way I would encourage you to think about it uh, as for what would be the marginal impact on of that particular step. But the way I would think about it is we have segregation. What are what 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 are the what is the area of control for the board and for other policymakers? What are the what are the actions that we're taking that may contribute to that segregation? And the star rating system is certainly one of them. So if you have the ability to remove one brick of that segregation wall, I would go ahead and, and, and remove it. I would wholeheartedly agree with you that that alone would not be sufficient to integrate the schools. We have to overcome the application barrier. We have to support parents to better understand the options that they have. We have to incentivize schools to have diverse student body. We talk about preference in the lottery for entry students. I know that's a conversation. There's many other things that we need to do, but that is one of them. And that's one that you have some impact on. Thank you very much. Representative Weidenberg. Um, thanks, I wanted to ask um, Ms. Young, in your opening comments, you talked about how you you all had looked at the idea of using school surveys and you had rejected it for now because there wasn't a, a citywide one. I will say a lot of people have raised with us, including the University of Chicago, which has done some of the best research in this area, that, it, that there should be these school-based surveys where teachers, parents, uh, students can comment on, on issues like, do I feel challenged? Do I feel safe? Can I raise questions, right? et cetera? Um, we had been uh, at, at an earlier point in this whole process, I, I think there was some thinking that, I mean, I have heard that we couldn't have a survey because the charters wouldn't want, we're not allowed to make the charters have surveys and so we shouldn't have a survey. So I'm curious if you think the charters are in a position where yeah. we could have a survey because then I do think yeah. we could really add into this a survey um, that would produce terrific uh, information and it would provide information that we could um, use for diagnostics, use for interventions, et cetera. So let me ask uh, you to comment on that. Sure. Um, I keep saying, I think I may be saying community service. I'm trying to say school survey. So. Right, yep, okay. yep. So several of, uh, several of the schools feel very wedded to their own survey and feel that it informs decisions that they're able to make with their families. So PCSB hasn't taken a stance saying there must be a citywide survey or there must not. If there was a citywide survey that the schools, that all of our LEAs did, then that would be a world in which we would reconsider it for the framework. Uh, we as the authorizer aren't in the position to mandate that type of survey for schools. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Representative O'Leary. No, I was just, that was for Alex and the students. Sorry. Understood, understood. Uh, Vice President Kasoy. Thank you. Um, first, I just really quickly wanted to say, Mr. Mizrav, uh, I meant to say that your description of Cardozo is so spot on. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Um, and my question is for Ms. Young. Um, building on what President Parker asked about sort of the impetus behind revisiting the PMF. I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about what you were finding or what you were hearing and from what sources that led to this uh, revisiting. Sure. Um, well, I'm not sure if um, some folks may remember that several years ago, well, not several years ago, maybe two or three years ago, uh, the city had equity reports, something called equity reports that were much more comprehensive than um, our PMF. So it provided data disaggregated by student group and it provided it and it showed where a school was in comparison with um, other schools that served a similar grade band. It wasn't a high stakes report and it wasn't um, a part of our accountability. It was there to provide additional information. Um, we haven't had that in the past few years and um, we definitely heard feedback that uh, that type of data was important. It was important to look at how individual student groups were doing. And it was important that our framework measure where uh, a school was taking a student um, 
and that there wasn't any sort of um, bias based on the demographic of the, of the students served. And so with that, we were really charged with, okay, what are the measures? What, are, what could we add and take away from our framework so that we are really measuring the school's contribution to the student, not just the population that the school has to get? And we heard that feedback from school leaders themselves, um, especially those with higher percentages of students um, from lower economic statuses. So that was part of the impetus. That is so helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. And it is my understanding, Representative Lopez, you have a comment or a question? Uh, yes. So good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much to the panelists. My apologies for the delayed comment. My virtual hand has disappeared for some reason off of my screen. Um, but I really enjoyed listening to the overall conversations today. I think that the STAR framework is something that I always come back to um, because I, from personal experience, I know that when I was choosing my high school, looking at the STAR rating for all schools was something that I went into. Um, and that was heavily impacted by the decision that I was making. Uh, the school that I attend now, check, was nowhere to be found with the rating system. That was not one of my choices. However, when we're talking about qualitative data, uh, which is something that I'm really just um, hopefully hoping that is something that is included in this new system that we're working forwards to, um, qualitative data could be just asking a student how they're feeling in the environment that they're learning in. And I think that could be really powerful data to look at. Um, surveys such as the Panorama Survey, I know ask similar questions, such as uh, how students are feeling with their relationships with their teachers, how students are feeling while they're learning in their classroom. Aspects such as those could be something that can be included and implemented into these, um, not ratings, but just websites that are created for um, such systems. Because decision-making is does not only involve a parent, uh, it also involves the student. At the end of the day, the student is the one who is in the schools and is receiving the education. Um, so it will definitely impact the way that they're feeling. And sometimes it's not that there's less resources, but the environment that you're in can be extremely uh, impactful to the way that you're taking in a lot of information. Thank you. Thank you. Such brilliance. Um, this was a great panel. Uh, I appreciate each of you for sharing uh, your expertise uh, and being willing to share. I, would, I, I just want to end on this note as we move to our public comment uh, that I personally, but I also think it's a sentiment of the board that we also need to do a lot more to support our schools. And yes, we need, and we've talked about ratings and we're focusing on accountability, uh, but that has to be coupled with support. Um, and I know that the board uh, years ago now had uh, our graduation uh, task force that came up with a number of recommendations, including personalized learning plans or PLPs. I know from the auditor's report, there has been a discussion around longitudinal data and the the districts need to enhance in that area. And I point to those things that repeatedly when I hear of things that would help parents truly um, uh, see how we as a system are supporting our students, we've not made a lot of progress in that area. Uh, similarly, I've heard from charter leaders that uh, there is a need for more uh, support and charter uh, uh, support, especially for single site leaders. Um, and that while I know some of that is happening, I think it's fair to say it's nascent at best. And so I just put that out there that it is my hope personally that as we continue with these conversations around accountability, which are essential and important, we also um, welcome you to lean in with us as we think about how we better support our schools. Uh, so with that, again, thank you for sharing your expertise with us, and we hope that you will join us uh, for the rest of our meeting and come back. Uh, members, that was an excellent uh, panel. We are now going to move to the public comment. Uh, we uh, are now at 7.08 p.m. Um, and as you know, at every public meeting, we hear testimony from public witnesses on education-related matters. 
your comments uh, for members of the public become part of our official record. Uh, if you would like to speak at a future public meeting, please sign up on the website at sboe.dc.gov or contact our staff by email at sboe.dc.gov. Uh, tonight, we will hear from more than 13 public witnesses, including those who have submit, submitted uh, written testimony. We will be holding to a strict time limit of three minutes for our witnesses. Uh, while you speak, there will be a timer on your screen if you set your view to gallery mode. Following each group of public witnesses, we will pause for questions from board members. Members will then have two minutes for questions uh, for uh, our witnesses. Mr. Hayworth will call. Uh, folk in, in groups of five as well as uh, during the question period. He will also mute witnesses and members uh, that exceed uh, their allotted time. Apologies in advance. Uh, and so with that, Mr. Hayworth, you may begin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Our first panelist tonight will be uh, Laura Fuchs. All right, thank you. Uh, I just got to the house, so perfect timing. Um, so I'm here before you today in, um, and I teach in a school that's been given every negative label and name under the sun by pernicious education reform driven policies that prefer to test, label, punish, and close schools rather than support them. Since Shelby began her tenure and through Farabee, schools have been open and closed at alarming rates and are largely justified using these labels. From DCBS to the Charter Center, this damaging and standardized test based system has done little to improve our students' outcomes and a whole lot of damage to school communities and stability. It is all of our faults, but I'm looking specifically at every person who voted for this star report card and those at Aussie, the DME and the mayor's office who perpetuate this toxic environment where school communities are devalued, where the relationships of teachers, students and the parents who hold no value at all, where adults make decisions that impact children for their own benefit. What I see from my classroom is a district obsessed with measuring things in a standardized way. I see endless trackers and consultants and database systems all tied up in the Aussie Star Report Card's arbitrary metrics. I see adults who have built their entire careers on looking at the human beings in our schools as data points that are somehow bad or failing, and those of us who serve them as problems that need to be fixed. I see a bunch of Teach for America alumni who couldn't last more than five years teaching trying to tell me, someone who's had 15 years of experience, that I did just this one little tracker and followed one more acronym or program. That way, everything will be better. Our, and then I get blamed when it's not. Our students see our so-called leadership at, at, at best. They see the little press conferences. They see these little all-star tours. Where don't they see our leaders? doing the work that actually helps the students in this city? Where don't they see them conducting the oversight that would not have allowed DCPS and this mayor to systemically disinvest in schools like Washington Met, depriving them of stability, adequate resources, and real programming that would have given them a shot at being successful too? My cat doesn't look like when I'm angry. Where don't they see them demanding real investment, not some tiny little grant that barely does anything? Um, fighting for equity and not equality. Something you clearly, they clearly don't understand at all, Miss Cat. All right. Um, our students don't see adults valuing them. They see them being judged from on high. They see adults standing by feeling satisfied with themselves and their work far away from students in these office buildings downtown doing nothing while a school community gets proposed to be ripped apart. They see phony engagement sessions and listening sessions and faux interest in what they have to say and they aren't fooled. I'm outraged at the way this city treats our students who are struggling. We say you're investing in them, but we don't. And the investments come with an implied threat. If you don't fix things in a short amount of time, it'll be closed into the star rating system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next panelist will be Reagan Alvin. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, Good evening, President Parker and the members of the State Board. It's a real pleasure to be here. My name is Reagan Alvin and I'm a senior at Wilson Senior High School in Ward 3. And I'm here to speak on matters of um, failing sanitary infrastructure. Um, I just like to say first that having returned to the in-person setting is such a great privilege, but after the first few weeks, it's become hazardous as a result of, of failure to uphold necessary infrastructure. I'm sure that I'd like to say first that I'm sure that Wilson is not alone in this matter. Even after 18 months of most students and staff being at home, 
the school's restrooms still remain in disrepair, just for an example. A large number of the toilets in women's restrooms have been out of order since even before the pandemic, and a toilet along with most of the urinal walls from the men's room have gone entirely missing. Even more dangerous, a majority of the sinks remain absolutely dysfunctional or require students to simultaneously press a knob in order for water to come out. Our soap, systems, our soap dispensers, which were broken for most of the 2019 to 2020 school year, have since been fixed, but now several have been out of soap for weeks or are once again broken. While some may argue that the hand sanitizer stations, which are amazing, that have been distributed along the school alleviate these issues, but several studies have shown that using soap and water with a lather is far more effective in terms of washing away certain strains of bacteria. In addition, the school also, was also provided water tanks by means of drink, for the means of drinking water as opposed to water fountains. But by midday, these tanks are empty and not refilled, thus depriving students, including those who have to go to ac um, athletic activities after school of water. Not only are these issues infringing on student learning, but they also interfere with the student staff's safety. And when I'm saying this, I mean by I by no means mean to speak ill of my school's custodial staff, North administration, as I'm certain that it is no easy task to uphold the cleanliness and infrastructure of a 320,000 square foot school that is 400 students over capacity and wholly understaffed. I'm sure that they're doing they are doing the best that they can. However, it is a matter of DCBS being unable to uphold its promises of building readiness in its free open strong campaign, not just for Wilson, but I assume most DC schools. On the DCBS website's building readiness checklist, it writes that it writes that its operations plan, which includes sink maintenance, toilet maintenance, and water access, is complete. But by what I have discovered, this is simply not true. On behalf of Wilson students and staff, I request that more funds and mind be paid to the bare essentials in fulfilling DCBS's promises to keep all of its schools across the board safe. I look forward to collaboration on this matter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good to see you again. Uh, Kathleen Coughlin. Ms. Coughlin? Okay, we'll wait uh, for her to be able to join. Um, Jasmia Shropshire. Good evening. Um, thank you members of the State Board for all of the amazing work you do for our community. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak with you all today. I'm Jasmia Shropshire, an epidemiologist, a DCPS student, and more importantly, a Ward 7 community member. Before I start, I know that you all are advocates for collective voices and the mayor um, makes final decisions. As such, please understand that I'm hoping my words reach her directly. I'm here today to urge the board to consider more equitable alternatives to continuing the school year amid the ongoing pandemic besides the vaccination mandates. Um, I'm deeply concerned that student voices are not being considered in this manner and there are no multi-tiered approaches to protecting our community long-term based on the data we already have in addition to the harsh reality that there is still so much data we simply do not have access to yet. This mandate is concerning because it does not address the spread of COVID among students. A direct quote from the CDC states that clinical trials show that all COVID-19 vaccines authorized in the U.S. are effective at preventing COVID-19, especially severe disease, hospitalization, and death. However, it is the case that vaccinated individuals can spread the virus. In DC specifically, from August 1st, 2020 to October 5th, 2021, overall childhood hospitalizations account for 588 cases. This includes age ranges of zero to 17 years, which translates to 0.005% of our DC youth population being hospitalized for COVID according to the CDC. My question is why are we forcing a vaccine that prevents hospitalizations when the risk percentage is so low? To be clear, any amount of risk is unbearable for our children. However, we cannot deny the fact that these numbers are low in trusting the science. Forcing this mandate seems to assume risk associated with hospitalizations are higher than the risk of the novel vaccine. If preventing the spread is our focus, why is there not fully funded staff supporting for regular testing across all schools? This is not another cost that an already stretched administration should have to incur. And I've listened to the last couple of public meetings and this seems to be an issue across LEA that the mayor and supporting organizations have failed to deliver 
on. Lastly, due to the mandate, many students are facing huge decisions that jeopardize their athletic careers, extracurricular activities, and not to mention their mental and emotional health because their desires are not being accommodated for. Please inform how youth are being included in these specific conversations. I know we are all more than ready to return to normal. However, we must not lose sight of the innovation that was born in order to keep our children safe. And that calls for doing things differently than how they have been done in the past. I've stated four critiques, and I want to be sure that I include four suggestions. One, opt out testing options, not opt in. Two, encouraging vaccinations for those who wish to participate and fully accommodations for those who do not. Three, detailed virtual learning options. And four, incorporating outdoor learning activities as much as possible. Overall, I'm looking for more equitable options and urge the board to consider advocating for families and children to make informed decisions. Thank you all for your time today. Thank you very much. Um, Kyle Myers. Mr. Myers, are you here? There you are. You can unmute for us, we're ready to hear. Yes, sir, thank you for having me. I hope everyone's having a good evening. All right, my name is Kyle Myers. I am a fifth generation Washingtonian and a Ward 5 resident. I am testifying on behalf of Democrats for Education Reform DC. I am pleased to offer this testimony on the importance of ensuring the Partnership for Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers, aka PARC, statement-wide annual assessment, and to make sure it gets administered to students next spring, and increasing equity within our DC school report card star rating system. I believe that both are essential to helping ensure our students are successful. The park statewide annual assessment has not been administered to our students in two years due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It is absolutely necessary that it returns in spring 2022. Excuse me. The park exam provides a citywide view of where all of our students are academically, um, of where our, all of our students are academically, excuse me, to change, direct resources to schools that need them most and provide critical information on DC school report cards. However, the park exam should not be tied to accountability in the spring of 2022. There are many ways to improve the park exam, including the following. Shorten the length of the exam, shorten the time it takes to get results back, and ensure students, families have the park exam scores, understand why the exam is important, and how to get appropriate accommodations if necessary. The exam should be shortened because over time, a student may lose focus on the test because of how long they are just sitting there in between sections and how many questions have to be answered on the test. In my previous experience with talking to students who have taken it, some have admitted to giving up two thirds of the way through the test because it is just too long. Further, the importance of the exam should be communicated to students and families. In order for us to measure where a student really is, if they have to put their best put forth the best efforts, excuse me, some students know that, some students know that the test does not um, account, sorry, some students know that the test does not count against them grading wise, and I have witnessed them stop trying due to that fact. I understand explaining the means of the test is important, but it is more important that the outcome is stressed way more. Results need to come back faster than they have in the past. The faster we know where the students are, the more help can be provided to students and schools. It is critical that the results are shared with parents so, that, so they are aware of their students' academic level. Additionally, schools should be sharing with families opportunities to get testing accommodations when needed based on issues they may have taken during the exam. I would also like to share my support for the DC school report card and STAR framework and the need to increase equity within it. An equ equitable public education system provides equitable access, inclusion, and resources. It ensures opportunities and prevents performance gaps between student groups. All of these things require objective student data about student incomes. In forbearance of this, we should assign higher star ratings to schools that are effectively educating certain student subgroups. Mr. Myers, I, I apologize. Your time has expired. If you can make sure that we get a, a written copy of your statement, I would be appreciated. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, Kathy sir. Riley. Thank you. Um, thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Kathy Riley and I'm the director of SHAPE, the Senior High Alliance of Parents, Principals and Educators. 
and the facilitator for the Ward 4 at Alliance and C4DC. I support the SBOE in examining the star rating system, which was released in December of 2018 after a very contentious debate. The star rating system weighs a number of measurable factors and assigns each school from one to five stars. As you consider this, I urge you to be respectful of the complexity of providing an education to our young people and humble. This instrument is limited, as your previous uh, panel said. As currently constructed, it has labeled as failing one or two star schools. These schools are often actually advancing and serving their students quite well, meeting them where they are, working with the challenges. The star rating system does not give context. It rewards secondary schools that are serving highly motivated students or students already performing at an advanced level. The academic measures do not show growth. Thus, it penalizes schools who are working with and supporting students arriving with more challenges. It does not give weight to programs preparing students to leave high school equipped to work in health, work in media, work in culinary arts, work in engineering fields or business or pursue a career in global studies even equipped with competence in two languages. The test scores matter more. It is a report card that reduces something that is complicated and then ranks it as if it is simple. As currently constructed, it does not provide, it does not in any way incentivize a broad and full educational experience, including social studies instruction at the elementary level. This is a huge problem in terms of our responsibility to our young people. Because of the limits of this tool and its wide use, it has misrepresented many of our schools. And in this competitive model that DC has adopted, deprived many students of making a much better match and looking at a full range of options, many closer to home. Because enrollment often means funds, it has, it has contributed to a further handicapping of many of these schools. As you examine it, you have the opportunity to look at dashboards or look at many other ways to give a fuller view, more reflective of what is actually going on in our schools. And as a second point, if you use this year, it is already pushing schools to rush students to graduate even as they have lost so much instructional time. Under our current circumstances, an extra semester or year could make a qualitative difference in a student's future. But doing this will subject the school and its teachers to a lower rating. So this might be something that you look at, you look at adjusting just as people have adjusted, you might be able to adjust some things for this year. So thank you. And I look forward to working with you further on this. Thank you very much. Mr. Goldstein, how are you, sir? Good, how are you? Good evening. Uh, good evening, members. I look forward to testifying next month on the issue of the star rating. Was excited to hear your expert witnesses uh, ask you to start with teachers uh, when developing a new system. But tonight, I'd like to focus my testimony on the continued urgency to address teacher retention. It's especially important at this moment to think of the issue as retention, not just turnover because we aren't thinking just about the educators we lost from last school year to this school year, but the ones we're actively losing right now mid-year. I was honored to speak at the Teacher Practice Committee last week to share some updates on retention and recommendations on the path forward. While DCPS has not yet released official turnover of retention numbers from 2021 to 2122, here are some facts we know right now. We've confirmed that more teachers departed DCPS from last year to this one than any year in recent memory. This confirms what we expected, a pandemic dip in turnover because it was nearly impossible to interview or move jobs or locations during the height of the pandemic, followed by a pandemic bump in turnover amidst plummeting morale and heightened teacher stress. We also know now that DCPS started the year with more vacancies than any recent year at 160 vacancies. Additionally, there have been a very high number of fall departures. Departures we don't wouldn't normally see at a minimum until the winter. This is all very concerning. I've been teaching and working with DC teachers for 15 years, and I've never seen educators' stress and feelings of hopelessness so high. It's crushing. This pandemic staffing crisis is not unique to DC, but in DC it adds insult to injury on top of our already lowest retention in the nation. And while this crisis persists, the DC Council has held multiple hearings on renaming schools, important to be sure, but delayed its first hearing on a far more urgent issue of addressing fleeing staff until December. SBOE has been a leader on this issue. You'd issued 10 meaningful recommendations over the past four years to address it. But to be honest, there's been far too little follow-up to press DC agencies to act with urgency. 
We can't keep spinning our wheels discussing this problem. It is urgent. In our recent citywide survey of over 300 residents and counting, 90% indicated they view our current teacher turnover rate as a problem for students in losing mentors in schools, losing stability, rather than a positive indicator that we may be switching out ineffective teachers for better ones. Let's please put that silly debate to rest. It harms kids. Below, I've posted a number of profound comments from DC residents from our survey, but how teacher turnover has impacted them, their students, their families, and their school communities. I'm listed here five or four high leverage, high impact recommendations to make a difference now. First, in the short term, dramatically increasing substitute pay, utilizing student teachers, bringing in additional staff. Second, convening the union and other stakeholders to propose a specific, not general, alternative to the current teacher evaluation system focused on growth, setting a deadline, and if it's not moving, going to council. This shouldn't wait indefinitely. Third, pushing for significant investments in shared leadership models in schools. And four, pushing for instituting a minimum salary in charters, where at half of our charter schools have a starting full-time salary with a low to DC living wage. I urge you to read all these comments, to hold meetings, to use your convening power, and to get to work because our students deserve it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, we are, are uh, ready for questions now. Please use the raise your hand feature and I will call on you in order. Um, as always, we will have uh, two minute rounds for questions. Um, is is Ms. Coughlin able to? Thank you for reminding me. Yes, Ms. Coughlin, are you able to um, to speak now? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, I, I don't know why the camera's not turning on, but if you can hear me, that I guess is good enough. Great, yes, go ahead and begin. Thank you, uh, Vice President Gasoy. Okay, um, good evening. My name is Kathleen Coughlin and I am a DCPS elementary teacher, but today I want to speak to you from a different perspective. And unfortunately, I will in many ways be echoing the public comment I gave at the DC Council hearing last month. This evening, I will highlight some of the continuing issues in regards to the quality and transparency of data about the spread of COVID-19 in DCPS. There continues to be a lack of cohesive, comprehensive, and comprehensible information shared with the public, and it is forcing teachers, administrators, and parents to make decisions from a place of fear, confusion, and unknowing that are ultimately harming the relationships among DCPS stakeholders. I feel that I have a better understanding than most about how COVID has been spreading in our schools based on what has been shared from government sources because I have poured dozens of hours of my free time into creating and maintaining a dashboard to analyze and share an overview of COVID-19 in DC public schools. Currently, there are three main places to find information about DCPS coronavirus cases. The running total of DCPS cases and quarantines on the DC Health coronavirus website, the K-12 schools data page on the DC Health website, and the individual case notification letters shared with the school communities and on the DCPS Reopen Strong website. Um, I've linked all of those pages in the written testimony. To disentangle the information from these three sources and find some clarity, I've coded, sorted, and visualized cases and quarantines for my dashboard. And in doing so, I've continued to watch the number of cases grow and the reported numbers diverge amongst sources. Amongst sources. For these three sources, the total number of cases for DCPS students and personnel from August 29th until this morning were 921, according to DC Health running, running total, 651, accounted for by notification letters and 438 on the DC Health K-12 case dashboard. Based on these websites, I cannot identify any good reason for them to have such wildly different totals. Are the cases counted differently? Is there a lag? Are some of the numbers just flat out incorrect? This disparity does not engender confidence in DC Health and DCPS's handling of the pandemic. And if the reported numbers are so profoundly different, who should parents and teachers trust as, a, as the truth? Additionally, based solely on these three sources I'm using, it's really challenging for anyone to understand the whole picture and contextualize their experience against other schools and the district as a whole. Just from looking at the long list of letter PDFs and the rolling total of cases and quarantines, could anyone say which ward has the most cases? Could anyone say which schools have had the most and least number of cases? Could anyone say which, pro or which proportion of DC cases are at different grade bands? average number of cases per schools, based on the sources, that information could be teased out. And I've done so, but only through, as I said, hours of effort. Um, but people should not have to do that. By the way, it's Ward 8, two schools with zero cases and one school with 27 cases and elementary schools. Even if those numbers were shared somewhere on these 
DC Health and DCPS websites, would they be proclaimed publicly or would they need to be sought out by committed computer savvy individuals with the time and know how to analyze them through spreadsheets and graphs? How can there be accountability when no one knows what's going on? Ignorance is not bliss, Ms. but Ms. rather Hoffman, I apologize. anxiety and uncertainty. We are at the end of time. If you can okay. make sure that we have a written state, uh, written copy of your uh, remarks, that would be helpful. Okay. Um, members, like I said, please do use the raise your hand feature and I will call on you in order. Um, we'll begin with Representative O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, John Paul. Um, and thanks everyone for coming here today. Um, I just wanna first spotlight uh, Reagan, who's been an SAC member, I believe for the past three years now. Um, and ever since I've been on the board on the SAC, she's been right there too. I and mean, I'm super happy to see her there today um, and really paying attention to an issue that um, certainly the Student Advisory Committee has been talking about um, even before we reopened. It was one of our biggest concerns about what this would look like. Um, if you don't believe me, you can check our annual report that we published uh, that, that was adopted um, last school year. Um, but I wanted to uh, specifically bring to light what Reagan was saying and I guess ask you, um, what do you think could be done um, from now um, going forward by uh, DC education officials um, and by potentially school administration um, on, the, on the health and safety of students and then sort of maintaining the safety of the school building, especially in a school um, like yours? Thank you so much, Representative O'Sullivan. I think that this is a very good question because we can always talk about problems, but it's even more important to come up with these solutions. Um, I think that a primary issue might be staffing. Even at my school, we have a janitorial staff, I believe of 10, I believe on the staff list, it said. And even so having to, that, that equates to around 30,000 square feet per janitor in an eight hour day, which along with refilling um, water jugs and making sure that the, and ensuring extra cleanliness as a result of the pandemic, more, more deep cleaning has to take place is results, I apologize, likely results in too much work on the custodial staff's plate. So I definitely think there's a staffing issue that could be resolved by hiring more staff for, hiring more custodial staff within schools. In addition, I believe that fixing the infrastructure within schools is something that needs to be put in order. For example, um, back, um, I believe the year before last, there were issues in regards to soap dispensers not working, being broken for several years on end. And with those being fixed, that began a step in the right direction. For instance, if this same approach was taken to, let's say, sinks, I think that that could hold great benefit. Thank you very much. Dr. Reed. Ms. Shropshire, are you there? Yes, I'm still here. Cool. Um, in your testimony, you mentioned full accommodations for those who do not wish to vaccinate. What are those accommodations? Um, Thank you for that question. I think what I am referring to is um, students not being penalized if they do not wish to vaccinate. Um, at this point, it's my understanding that the mandate is for athletes specifically. And if they are choosing not to be vaccinated, they're unable to play at, you know, do their regular practices, participate in games as well. Um, and I think that there should be some type of accommodation that allows them to continue their extracurriculars without being penalized for making an informed decision for themselves. Thank you. I'm done with my time. Thank you very much. Ms. Thompson. Um, thank you to the panel uh, for being here with us this evening. Uh, my question uh, is actually for Ms. Wiley. Um, you talked about, and I, and I know you um, participated in, uh, the last engagement uh, with the STAR framework. Could you uh, just speak more to what you would like to see, especially for high schools? Um, like what, what would be fair measurement? What would that look like? Um, well, I think first of all, this, that take the STAR rating away, take the one rating away would be fair because I don't think we can reduce it that far. I think some qualitative measures that would include the kind of programming. And I, I agree with some kind of satisfaction survey that you know showed how people felt at that school. 
maybe some measures of what type of mentoring, some description, descriptive measures. And for sure, you know, I think a growth measure is important, but I think it's all limited if it's only aligned to the park. You know, I mean, if a growth measure would have to be explored in a way of we, and I don't have that at the tip of my tongue, where students could land given where they started. You might look at with the number of ELL students, how they progressed. You might, you might look at some of the, not just the graduation rate. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll think more about that. But the first, I mean, I mainly feel how damaging what we've done has been and the lack of anything that really gives us a real sure sense of what's going on at that school. And, you know, when you look at the beginning and it has, I'm sorry, I'm using up too much of your time, but it just lists the at-risk special ed ELL and then the money, if you don't get the sense of that the money actually has to fund those students. So um, thanks for the question. No worries. My time. Um, I don't have any other questions because I don't have any more time. <laughs> but, but I think the time thanks. was a little bit off. Uh, thank it was you. the rest of the other one's time. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Riley. Dr. O'Leary. Uh, I, I want to thank you all for your testimony. Uh, it's depressing testimony. It says a lot for what's not being done in the city. This was a, a varied, varied testimony. Um, uh, I, I don't really have a lot to say, and I don't really have any questions. I know that y'all are frustrated with what's going on in the school system. And we have to raise our voices to get people involved to change what's going on. Because if, if people aren't involved in the change, then it'll never change. And it's really not good. I mean, when um, Ms. Alvin was talking about infrastructure at Wilson, you're so lucky to be at Wilson compared to some other schools in the city. And, and that's horrible to say. When we have students who aren't um, given a quality education every day because they're not comfortable in their, in their rooms, uh, that's a really big problem. So we, uh, we've got a lot of work to do. And you need to, your age, obviously I'm older than everybody, but your age needs to be an asset rather than a deterrent. You need to raise your voices and get the leaders in the city to get to work. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Wattenberg. Um, thanks to everybody. Let me start with uh, Reagan. Um, a student at Wilson, the alma mater of my son. Um, so I want to say a couple of things, and I want people to understand it. Prior to the pandemic, I can I, I think literally and absolutely I got more calls, emails, and everything about the lack of soap in the bathrooms at Wilson and Deal than anything ever anywhere at all. Um, so I'm glad to hear that if I understood that right, that the soap seems to be in a much better situation. So that's, that's good. But I, I wanna to say to everybody, it was a factor in completely ruining the confidence of Wilson families and students that there was any possibility of having a safe return to school because the idea was if you can't even fill up the, you know, the soap dispensers, how can you do the rest of this? And you are explaining to us that that is a problem. So um, one thing I'm thinking of, and I agree with you, I think the, the issue is not really um, the, the custodial staff's failure to do stuff per se. I think it may be staffing, but I also think some of this stuff, the, I mean, the, the coolers, there, there's stuff that is also well outside of Wilson. And I wanna throw out one idea for everybody to think about, which is, um, I know there's been some discussion of there ought to be sort of a, um, an HVAC infrastructure dashboard that was available for every, every school. And I, I think that is a great idea. And I want, there's a governance hearing coming up next week where people are talking about what are some of the roles that the state board uh, ought to have. And I think one thing that potentially the board could do is be responsible for being able to push out a lot of this data on a regular basis. I think that happens in some other states that you know if there's information you need, 
that's where you go. And it becomes incumbent on these elected officials to make sure it's there. So I appreciate you raising it. And I was gonna say many nice things about many of the other people on the panel and I don't have time. So thank you all for coming. And I do wanna say Scott Goldstein heard, I know it's a huge, huge issue. Uh, Kathy Riley, I hope that when you go, I know you're gonna be engaging Ward 4 families around the star rating. So please ask them the questions you were asked. What do people think reflects quality and effectiveness so that we can push to include that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Sutter. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hayworth. Um, I wanted to just point out, Ms. Riley mentioned growth for English language learners, and that is in the star rating. So I certainly think that perhaps weighting it more or adding more information may be something folks want to see, but there is growth for L's on the access um, in the star rating now. So I just want to make that point publicly. Um, Ms. Coughlin, I actually wanted to give my time to you because I'd love to hear your suggestions on how to solve this. What would be a better way to do this? So I yield my remaining time to you. Oh, um, thank you. I was, let me open my testimony again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Sorry, I didn't give you fair warning. No, it's okay. I have it. Um, I just have one. I'll just read the paragraph. And then if you have any questions, I'll um, a clear and transparent plan for analyzing and publicizing DCPS COVID data could go a long way to build trust in the mitigation systems that DCPS claims are working well. Um, and I urge the State Board of Education to pressure DC Council, DC Health, and DCPS to maintain clear and easily available information so that it can be determined what COVID precautions are working and what improvements need to be made. Um, so basically, there there's no way, there's no place to look and clearly see what's going on um, from DCPS or DC Health, especially with all of the numbers that they're publicizing being different. Um, so I would like some clarity on why those numbers are different because that they're massively different. It's not like one or two cases, it's 900, 600, 400. Yeah, That's yeah. absurd. Yeah, that is enormous disparity. And I appreciate that request to have that clarity about where the data is coming from, why it's different um, and, and how they're calculating it. So thank you very much for that, Ms. Coughlin. Representative Chang has yielded his time to Representative Thompson. Representative Thompson. Uh, yeah, so I have uh, actually a similar question for uh, Ms. Laura, no, I still see Laura, uh, Ms. Fuchs. Uh, because Laura has been teaching for 15 years at a high school. Uh, <laughs> and so I would be curious what Laura thinks uh, as far as capturing um, quality. And if there's time left, then maybe uh, Reagan could give her two cents as well. Are you talking about like in the star report card? Yeah. And maybe we shouldn't call it the star thing. Maybe we should just call it the report card since <laughs> eight star. <laughs> One, like, I just don't like rating things in general. I don't like rating students. I don't like rating schools. I don't like assigning grades. I just don't think it's really that effective a method of really instilling intrinsic love of learning, which I would hope is one of our goals as an educator. But of course, I do grade my students a bit, um, but I certainly don't stack them up against each other and start rating them. Um, so I guess just to me, it's like, it's just the attitude towards it. Like, I don't feel like I have the answers or why I probably wouldn't run for something like this where you have to come up with the answers, but I believe in processes. So I would definitely want, you know, um, educators at the table. I'd want students at the table and parents, and I'd want us to limit the amount of standardization that is included to the bare minimum that is required and really just focus on what do we want to see from our schools and students' educations, and then how can we do that in a way that actually would promote us promoting it in schools. Because right now we promote test, drill, and kill. We promote, you know, the limiting of the curriculum. And that just, it doesn't help anybody. Um, Thanks, Laura. I don't, Reagan, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that, what we should be paying attention to. I think I'm just going to be echo chambering what the rest of the council said and that we should focus more on growth than just a baseline of performance because we shouldn't be rewarding schools for just having what the system defines as stronger students, we should be defining teachers and staff as how well we can foster you know, growth, which is what schools are for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Vice President Gasoy. 
I don't have uh, questions. They were all asked, um, but I do just want to say, uh, Mr. Goldstein, yes, we hear you and we are working on it. Um, so we, we also feel the urgency and are looking forward to sort of following up on the research we have done and um, sort of the momentum we've already created. So thank you for the push <laughs> and for, the, uh, for coming to our committee meeting last week. Um, and Ms. Coughlin, I guess maybe I do have a question for you. I know that you, I think you said you shared testimony at um, the council hearing maybe, but I was just wondering if you have tried to get answers um, from DC Health and from DCPS about you know, these disparities and also why they aren't um, sharing more data than they are. Um, I really wouldn't know who to contact about that, um, to ask why things are different. I've read the data guides that DC Health has that explain um, on each of the pages what, where their numbers are coming from. Uh, some of those have not been updated recently, so I don't know if it's different, but um, I, I guess I wouldn't know who, who to talk to about that. Okay, thank you. And thank you for bringing it to us. Um, we'll try to find out <laughs> who to bring it to. It's really important. And it's, you shared your, you said you had a um, dashboard. Did you share that link in your testimony as well? Yes, there, yes. All right, thank you. Thank you, President Parker. Thank you all for your testimony, uh, Ms. Riley. Uh, as always, it's great to see you. I do have a question about, we've heard a lot about balancing um, uh, um, proficiency and growth, um, as well as balancing some of the quantitative elements of our framework with the more qualitative elements. Can you speak to uh, the work that I know you've done or others have done around like the use of surveys? We talk talked about that a little bit earlier with our panel and like how that might uh, add value to our current framework. I'm afraid you're muted. I think I share some of Laura's feelings about the way you're balancing proficiency and growth and how you measure growth. You know, for one thing, we're the only state that only uses the park. So the, the actual thing that you're using might be flawed to begin with. And then when we look at the other tests that you're using, AP and IB, they, they don't measure what a lot of our students are doing. So that aside, I think you have to look at that. Uh, with surveys, you know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not an expert on surveys, but my experience in some of the schools that are one and two stars is that the students are happy that they're feeling met from where they are and that they're advancing from where they are and that they have successful post-secondary experiences. So we don't have many measures for that right now, but I think we could get some that would measure. So it would both be surveys. And I think, you know, you just measure college going in a way. I mean, you do some other things, but we could do a lot better job of uh, finding out where the kids are. Um, so I, I'd be happy to help you more out with that, but I'm, that's as much as I can get you right now. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and I'm short on time and I'm gonna use this as a plug to complete the parent and teacher survey for our assessment accountability uh, committee uh, where we are seeking your input. And so you can reach out to your representative or uh, look at the state board social media or website for more information. Thank, Thank you. you. Representative uh, Johnson. Hello, bear with me. I'm having a little bit of connectivity issues. I am glitching a little bit. <laughs> this isn't my best computer right now but i just wanted to say thank you panelists and i don't have a specific question but i do have some comments um i was in the process of taking some notes and so i just wanted to say that i too am frustrated with the lack of consideration for student environments how are we expected to, to thrive in our environments when we lack the basic necess uh, necessities and in regards to standardized testing I just want to know how we can implement more youth voices and really get into the discussion of how um, standardized testing scores do not reflect our predictors of our future successions. Um, 
I feel as though being a Ward 8 student myself, sometimes we confuse these test scores with the labels for our future. I feel as though sometimes people and people in positions of authority look at these test scores and they define us and who we are and our character. And that's not the label for our future. We are more than just a number or our scores on tests. And we do need to listen to you more. And so that's all I have to say today. But thank you. I'm sorry. I'm really the clock is still running. That is all my time. So we can give it to studies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Representative Johnson, you might try turning off your camera. Sometimes that helps the bandwidth issue uh, slightly. Um, panelists, that is the end of our questions. Thank you so much for being here. If you can go ahead and log off, I'll bring in the second panel and we can continue our discussion. Um, Right. Thank you so much, uh, panelists, for being so patient with us in the waiting room. Uh, we really do appreciate your time. Um, I do want to note each of you will have three minutes for your testimony today. Um, I will be calling you in the order that you uh, were on the agenda, and then we will do a single round of questions from members. Um, and our first panelist today um, on this panel will be Mary Holmes. Hi, good evening. Um, I want to thank everybody uh, for the time and the opportunity to bring a concern to the board, uh, a concern that I have for students in D.C. Um, I'm a parent and uh, I have a child in DCPS and I'm a resident of Ward 6. Um, and this school year brought to our attention, my husband and I, something that we thought um, was a little disturbing in, return, in, in terms of student privacy. Um, uh, while we enrolled our child for the, this is our first year as parents uh, in DCPS, we were inundated with app requests and um, just third party uh, platforms that the students have been using in class. Um, and I understand, and I think everybody can appreciate that having gone virtual, the schools have had to incorporate new technology like never before. And I, I applaud all the efforts that have been made. But one thing that we've noticed is that our child's information, like their name and their birth date, et cetera, has been provided to different applications that are typically web-based. Um, and we haven't actually given any permission to the school to do that. So uh, something just I, I wanted to bring to the attention of the board would be a concern that I shared with some other friends uh, that, you know, out of nowhere, I got an, in, an email from an application called Ignite asking me to submit my child's picture so that they could use it, the app with their photo. And they had my child's name, they had my child, they asked for my child's picture and they said it was through the school and they had my email. Um, I didn't actually give permission for my email to be shared to a third party or my daughter's name or her birth date, which was supposed to be the sign on for her. Um, and I certainly didn't want to provide my the child's picture. So I reached out to the teacher to ask what the app was used for. And she informed me that she had no intention of actually using it in her classroom, that it was something that they were thinking of using if we had to go virtual and the children needed supplemental um, instruction. So I just it raised a concern because we wanted to know exactly what apps we were actually going to be using in the classroom and what information had been provided to each of those um, vendors. So uh, I asked, I said, what, can you just give me a list of, you know, all of the apps that you're going to use or that the school has sent my child's name and birth date to? And the teacher couldn't answer. She pushed the question up uh, through DCPS and she forwarded an email to me that basically said, you know, oh, their, their student ID is randomized and they use, and these applications meet criteria. That's all well and good, but I think as a parent, we should know upfront what they're going to be using and we should be giving permission to the school to share our children's information before it is. And um, I definitely, you know, as far as the different things that they're using in the classroom, 
these are often web-based applications and there's pictures of our children. There's their name, there's where they are, you know, five days a week. That's a lot of information that can be used for phishing. And so we want to know as parents, especially my husband and I, um, what kind of information is, or what is in place to protect our children's information. And also what um, criteria has to be met by these companies as far as, you know, informing us of data breaches, et cetera, um, with that information. So I wanted to bring that to the attention of the board. Thank you for the forum. Um, I don't really know where to go. I'm here as a learning yeah. experience of where to bring this. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, David Tanzi. Good evening. Um, my name is David Tanzi. I'm a math teacher at McKinley Tech High School. This is my 13th year teaching secondary math in the district. I also spent a decade as part of Langley Elementary's PTA, spending much of my time assuaging potential parents' concerns that their neighborhood school might not be appropriate for their child. The district's ratings never once assisted me in getting parents to give Langley a chance. It took community events, meet and greets with the principal in my living room, and tents at the farmer's market to give parents a sense of the school as a warm, welcoming environment where their child would succeed. I came tonight to argue that whatever the rating system being considered, one of the layers of review needs to be on equity, specifically whether the options being reviewed unnecessarily compound the already existing tendency for schools to be segregated by class and race. This will require that we balance that which allows for equity and that which allows schools and parents to easily self-sort. I will give an example of this potential conflict. This comparison assumes that we, we can accurately identify the degree of learning that happens at a school Keep in mind that this is not currently the case. One school has demonstrated the greatest amount of learning in the district, something above one year of learning per year. The school happens to serve students who come in behind academically, so its proficiency ratings are not where one would hope they would be. Another school has demonstrated that its students average one year of learning per year, but almost all come in proficient, so their proficiency rates are much higher than the first schools. Which is the better school? What information do we emphasize to parents that are choosing between them? Both demonstrate that learning is happening in the classrooms, but the proficiency rates give away something that, about the academic background of the student body. Does emphasizing that data serve our students or just compound in inequity? It is very difficult to measure the quality of a school without student-based longitudinal data that is diagnostic in nature. Unfortunately, our data is structured to have the unit of measure be the school rather than the student. The test we have chosen, PARC, is also not designed to demonstrate growth by an individual student. The data provided is too blunt. We could still make progress on this front though. We could start collecting student-based longitudinal data and we could find ways to approximate the degree of individual growth. No matter what, it would be hard to rate a school on how they are doing with students that are far behind from being on grade level. It also creates a perverse incentive to serve those most likely to make you look good, those already on grade level or near it. At this point in time, I encourage the State Board of Education to do whatever is necessary to start collecting student-based longitudinal data that in itself will provide many insights. I also encourage you to consider how whatever rating is being considered may compound existing academic inequities. I hope that exploration will create guidelines that can be used when we make decisions in the future on what district-wide tests we choose, how we improve our school choice infrastructure, and how we speak on these issues in general. I hope this conversation goes from where schools rank to how we can most effectively create the school system we want for our children one where each feels welcome, encouraged, and challenged to grow. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Members, uh, we will continue our round of questions. Please use the raise your hand feature to let us know um, that you have a question for this panel. Um, I will note, um, I do have a request already in to find additional information for Ms. Holmes on where um, and who is responsible for the tech data. Um, and I will be following up with Ms. Holmes directly on that after the meeting. Um, Dr. Sutter. Thank you, and thank you for that, Mr. Hayworth. Uh, Ms. Holmes, thank you very much for coming to raise this issue with the board tonight. I just wanted to make sure I understand what you would hope to receive from the school uh, if you had your druthers. So it sounds like you'd want to make sure that there was a clear communication of any and all apps that were intended to be used by the classroom teacher or the school, and there would be a process for permission for tech parents to either grant or not grant access for their child's data to be used as part of that work. Is there anything else? 
yeah, I really would like, I, I feel like it has to be more transparent with the data privacy for each of those apps. Um, I think that's something we need to be aware of as far as, you know, in the, I don't think it's actually a law in DC if, if, if there's a breach of communication that they have to actually disclose that or a breach of data, they have to disclose that. In California, for instance, um, if there is a data breach, they're obligated to disclose what data has been breached. I don't really know if that's in place for these particular applications. And I know that's a huge, you know, a very, very large issue, but in terms of like my child, I'd like to know it, that stuff is all those boxes have been checked and that information is accessible for parents. It was actually just really interesting to see that they were scrambling to give me the information. This is information that I think should be, you know, clicks away for me to access myself. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ms. Holmes. I appreciate that. Thank you. Dr. Reed. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Holmes, for raising that. Um, as technology is becoming more prevalent in our education spaces. It's, um, I know a topic of interest for me, and I believe um, there's a committee on our board that's looking at just certain things around um, um, the technology used, um, how it's used. I'm also like listening to your testimony thinking, you know, all schools using the same apps. Do everyone has the same access to those apps? What about our charter sector? Um, where does the notification go? Should there be a breach? Does it go to central? What's the communication process if that breach happens to get to parents or is it happening directly to parents? So your um, comments are really timely because um, it was something raised in one of our committee's work plans. And I believe we're gonna just kind of look at it um, soon, but we were actually looking at kind of like tech quality, but it's actually, good to hear about like the components of how technology is being used in school that I don't think we're necessarily at least on my radar. So this is really helpful to think about other perspectives of as we expand the use of technology in schools, what are some things that we're just not even considering? So thank you. And I'm not sure if you want to add anything. I didn't ask a question. I just wanted to just reinforce thanks for your testimony. <laughs> um, yeah, like, mm -hmm. You know, th there's so many apps and everything. I don't even know if the notifications I'm getting to my email are legitimately something my teacher is using because she hasn't, or the school, I shouldn't, the teacher is not <laughs> at fault here whatsoever, yeah. but the school hasn't made it clear to parents what to expect and what apps and et cetera ahead mm -hmm. of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. O'Leary. I'd like to just piggyback on what y'all have been talking about, I, I didn't know that that was a, a problem, but I'm just thinking about all of these parents that don't really have that much access to the internet, but all their children's information is being given to these third parties. I, I, I'm, I'm the worst case scenario kind of guy. Uh, I'd also like to ask Mr. Tansy about the park test. When the park test is given in the spring, it's usually April, right? I believe the second week in April or something like that. When do the results come back? You're on mute. They tend to come in over the summer. Um, right. That's, a, that's, 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 that's the answer I want. Um, now they used to come in later, so they've gotten better at, at trying to make it happen mm -hmm. by the beginning of the next school year. But I, I've taught ninth graders the past couple of years. And I have to really dig to get any data on my incoming freshman. But think I've about it. I've never gotten about, more than a quarter or 30% or of the park scores from incoming freshmen. And, and that's what has made me realize that the unit isn't right, that the system needs to be based off how Frazier is doing. And we can see how Frazier has progressed over the past five years of taking park rather than just what their school average was. But one of the things that I noticed is because I was teaching when Park started for about five years, I guess now, um, is the students didn't buy into the park at all. Oh, no. It didn't mean anything to them when no. they took it. It wasn't like a test in my class or a test that, yep. uh, or even the AP exam. My AP students, they were, they were very, very, focused on doing well on the AP test, Sure. all right? But the students didn't care at all about what they got on the park. Well, I think and that yet, that but also the teachers, to the- But the teachers did. Yeah, well, it speaks to the issue of, of equity that um, 
you're not going to have the same response. And a lot of it is about whether or not school generally seems like a legitimate experience for students. And I was at Dunbar for seven years. So I know the Cardozo similar experience well. And it, you have to really make a pitch like this. This is trying to serve some greater purpose. Um, but that's that's a tall, tall order for someone who has to sit there for, you know, days and sometimes weeks. And we lost weeks of instruction taking this test. Thank you very much. Representative Wattenberg. Thanks. Um, uh, I think we've um, grilled Ms. Holmes. I'm now going to uh, grill Mr. Tanzi. Um, I wonder if you could, so the, the board plans on making some recommendations to Aussie about the ways in which the rating reporting accountability system could be improved. And I wonder if you could just name a few ways, things we shouldn't do, things we should do, indicators that we should include, indicators we shouldn't include. You know, you've been- I, I mean, I, I've been unfortunately preaching this gospel for a long time, but just so it's clear what longitudinal student-based data means, it means that we can look up how this student, David Tanzi, has done over the past few years. So then we can then assess, oh, did switching to this school help or hurt? Right? Did uh, did the transition to, you know, to high school, you know, happen smoothly? High school is a little harder because we test. Uh, well, we're starting to test ninth and tenth grade, but it's a little bit harder. But the biggest one is we can see whether or not that individual student is making the progress they need to be making, and that should be the question. And so the benefit of longitudinal data is that it answers those questions and it doesn't detract from the assessment requirements we currently have that are school-based. So long as the data is contained per student rather than per school, we can then say, oh, it's also tagged at this school or that school. It can still give us all the same reports we want, but the reverse isn't true. If we only know data collected by school, we can't then go back and say, okay, but now I wanna know it by student, right? So I think that's the biggest point we need to make. Can I ask you a question? So are you saying that we need to improve our, what I think of as sort of a formative assessment system so that you guys are getting more? Well, some of it is we're getting better data, but I mean how we're actually saving it, like how you design the database. When I look something up right now, I look up McKinley. I look up Dunbar. I don't look up, you know, child 34782 to see how they're doing. And I can't. There's currently no way for me to see how this kid did, this kid, not this school, this child did over the past five years. Thank and you very much. Design it so that you can do that, you can't get meaningful data. We can't have meaningful measures of schools. Thank you very much. Oh. Uh, Representative Thompson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tansy, for clarifying uh, for all of us, because <laughs> uh, you're right. Um, I guess my question would be, I would be curious to hear, uh, during your time talking to families, um, what some of the concerns were or how people articulated their concerns around the quality of their neighborhood school. Uh, cause you spoke to, you know, going to farmer's markets and other places sure. trying to assuage fears. So I would be curious, um, sure. if there's anything that stuck out. So there were sort of two themes. One was just ignorance, right? When I first joined the PTA, at one point, I was the only member of the PTA. When I first joined the PTA, um, there just there had been such turnover with administrations it becoming an education campus and then an elementary school and all this stuff that there wasn't a lot of experience in the neighborhood. So some of it was just like, what is it like? And I like to say, well, let's go, right? We start having public events. You know, how do in the winter, how do we have stuff in the gym? so that it gets people in the building and they're like, oh, look, there's student art on the wall. And it looks like a place where kids are learning and enjoying themselves, right? So some of it was that sense of things, which is why when I took the survey, I was like, I'm forgetting what all the guidelines were, but you know, a, a valid measure of school climate or something like that. And then the second one was like risk aversion. It was what happens if my kid has a bad, first grade, like, is their future over, right? So fortunately, I've done lots and lots of research on this. And you know what? It's not over. And I could speak to all the data. And some of it, I'll speak bluntly now, even if it's just 30 seconds, the parents I were talking to generally were 
both parents are college educated families. It's like your kid is going to learn what they need to learn no matter where they go, so long as it is a warm, welcoming environment. So stop putting all your kids in the same couple of schools because that doesn't help anybody. Now, that's not true, by the way, in middle school and high school, but in elementary school, it's it's totally true. It's, it's an important distinction, right? Like, does the school offer algebra in eighth grade and things like that are important in middle school. But in elementary school, it, it really doesn't matter that much where your kid goes, so long as it's a warm, welcoming environment. Thank you for your honesty, Mr. Tansy. And I definitely remember when you were the only member of the PTA and you no. were not a parent. <laughs> so exactly. I, I joined I the PTA you. five years before my first job. Before. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, President Parker. Um, it's good to see you, Mr. Tansy. Uh, hey. And I think uh, I echo a lot of your sentiments and to the look at where Langley is today, uh, your your work there certainly paid off. So thank you. Uh, I just wanted to just go back to some of the things that or questions I asked our panel earlier, namely around a dashboard. There's been this discussion around the value of having a dashboard, pros and cons, and would just love for you to weigh in there. But also what you would encourage us as board members to consider as we're taking up uh, the task of offering recommendations of improving our accountability system? Yeah. Um, so, like I said, the biggest push is I think we need to emphasize the value of student based longitudinal data. I think it will actually provide a lot of insights. I think it'll show that most students are learning in most places. So, the idea that we have this huge list of failing schools is just false, right? And then it starts to allow us to go, okay, which students are doing well? well where, right? And which groups of students really aren't, right? And then that goes from being a kind of reactive, are you a good school or a bad school to who has figured out how to serve whom? And that's the real tough information. And so growth is Can important, but longitudinal growth is what's really important. Yeah, just in my last 30 seconds, I totally agree. And yeah. again, I would say the state board offered up that recommendation around personal learning plans years ago. And unfortunately, it did not move forward with ASI. But um, how would you suggest we handle like the sensitivity of personal student data? That oh, would you, are that you personal data would be aggregated. You as a parent, you couldn't be like, how is this kid or that kid? Doing? Exactly. But it would be saying, on average, the kids have made one year of growth. Who cares what, oh, the, what the, the average proficiency rating is? It's a good school. Kids are learning, right? The fact that everyone has a five just means that all their parents, this is a simplification, but it tends to mean your parents are well off and well educated, right? The data correlates, I've testified on this in the past, the data correlates very strongly. I could talk all night, but unfortunately, my time is up. Thank you. Members, that is the end of the question round. Um, panelists, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Ms. Holmes, I will be following up with you directly. Mr. Tanzi, always a pleasure to see you. Welcome back to the state board. Um, and um, members, if you do have additional questions for any panelists, of course, feel free to email me and I will follow up with them so that we can all have those uh, answers. Uh, panelists, feel free to go ahead and log off the meeting now and we will continue with the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, uh, members. I am uh, going to move that we amend the agenda, uh, knowing that we have a number of resolutions, ceremonial resolutions. Um, and I'm sensitive because one of our colleagues, Representative Chang, has to leave early, um, but also want to make sure that we give him an opportunity to weigh in on another voting matter. So I'm going to propose uh, in the next this is how we're gonna do the ceremonial resolutions, that we vote on them in block, uh, that members that may have put up the resolution uh, can move it. If there are multiple members, uh, that that other member can second it, um, that we will not, we will forego reading the resolutions into the record because they are already uh, publicly available. And we would allow for very brief comment. And I would uh, request that members keep comments short 
uh, but allow all members to make a comment should they want to. And then we would vote on them in one block, assuming that there will not be any um, um, nays to any of the ceremonial resolutions. Are there any objections uh, to this adjustment or questions? Okay, so just to repeat, we will move to vote on our ceremonial resolutions in block. We will not read them. Uh, we would allow the members that put them up. And so I would, you know who you are. If you did not put up the ceremonial resolution, I res re would respectfully ask that you not move or second the uh, motion. Uh, and then at the end, we would allow all members to comment on any of the resolutions briefly that they would like to. So with that change, um, Mr. Hayworth, now I've just said that that's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to call. I'd like to make a motion that we uh, accept all of the ceremonial resolutions. President that... Parker, can I ask a clarifying question about the comments? Yes. Are we making comments by resolution or at the end in one? That feels like it perhaps will be a little confusing given that there are six very distinct topics. Uh, the motion was to uh, have comments at the end in one, uh, but if you wanted to uh, have comments about multiple ones, you could. Okay. It, yep. it feels like it could get messy, but that's, well, I guess we'll do our best. Hey, that's what we do. Yes. So there is a motion uh, to vote on the ceremonial resolutions in block. Is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Please, please say nay. The eyes of the chair, the eyes have it. And again, uh, my apologies, but I really do want to get Representative Chang in on uh, the, the voting matter later in the uh, agenda. Um, and so first up, we have, uh, let me just make sure I have this. Sorry, one second. Awesome. Okay. Um, shouldn't, uh, you, shouldn't the comments be made now, though? Uh, if there are any? At the end. At the end. At the uh, end of what? At the, We're going to move and second all of the resolutions, and then we would open up the floor to make comments on any of them. Well, there's right. two different okay. kinds of resolutions. All right, this is what we're going to do. Let's table this for now. I'm going to move that we amend the agenda and let's just move up. Uh, give All me right. one oh, second. Wait, but there was, a, there was a motion on the floor. And so my, I guess my question would be, if we move, if we, if we just voted to move them all as a block, then why are we introducing them separately? They Like we would just say, we approve all of them, right? Like, sorry, jump, jump home. The, the motion was to move each of them individually to vote on them in block. And the point oh, that's of not what Frazier said, though. And oh, sorry, I'll wait, jump Paul. <laughs> the point of it was to uh, safeguard time. This is, I'm going to make a new motion. Uh, I'm right, Mr. President, you can't do that. There's okay, a motion on the table. Uh, I apologize. As, as parliamentarian, let me just clarify real quick, and then we can. I think we can move forward. Um, so the motion on the table is that the vote will be on all ceremonial resolutions in right. block. What I would suggest now is that we go to discussion on on CR twenty one nineteen. Go through the ceremonials, and then we will vote at the end on all of them because that's that's the motion that's on the floor. Can I comment? Not um, to overcomplicate this, I know the motion is on the floor. I know we voted on it, but I'm also looking at the clock. And the point of moving was to get in before Representative Chang had to go, and he has to leave at 8:45. And so my, now I'm I would my, welcome a new motion to um, agenda uh, adjust the agenda. My suggestion would be that the motion would be to table ceremonials to to bring up to the table. SR 21-7 uh, for, for um, uh, review. Thank you. No problem. 21-6. Uh, um, uh, 
no, 21-7, I believe, the LGBTQ um, uh, resolution. It says six on mine. I just didn't know. Yes. Okay. Um, we will table the ceremonial resolutions for now, and uh, we will take up uh, resolution 21-7. Mr. Hayworth, can you read the resolution into the record? State Board of Education uh, resolution on LGBTQ plus inclusive education standards, SR 21-7. Whereas the 2019 District of Columbia Youth Risk Behavior Survey found that lesbian, gay, and bisexual students make up 15.9% of high school students in the district, and transgender students make up 1.9% of district high school students. Whereas in the district, these students, in comparison to their heterosexual peers, experience double the rate of bullying on school property, report higher rates of being removed from class for disciplinary reasons, and are more than twice as likely to experience some su suicidal ideation. Whereas national data shows that lesbian, gay, and bisexual students are significantly more likely to receive grades of D or F than their heterosexual peers, and were more likely to be truant. Whereas consistent research suggests that students with LGBTQ plus inclusive curricula in their schools are more likely to report lower frequency of bullying, lower levels of depression, more accepting peers, and greater feelings of safety in school. And this safety leads students to report higher attendance, higher GPAs, and a set, greater sense of belonging in the school community, and higher educational aspirations. Whereas research shows that multicultural education helps prevent the formation of bias and prejudice and creates more democratic communities. Whereas the State Board of Education recognizes the need to have revised social studies standards that create windows and mirrors so students see themselves and people like them reflected in the content of standards and curriculum, as well as having the opportunity to learn about diverse people, cultures, places, and experiences unlike themselves, explicitly noting that current standards emph emphasize the lives of presidents and other figures who held and hold power and underrepresent or lack representation of peoples and groups like those identifying as LGBTQ plus and their respective histories. Whereas in the State Board of Education's review and revision, of the social studies standards, the state board called upon the office of the state superintendent for education to seek standard writers who reflect the demographics and experiences of district students and of the communities they are writing about, sharing a list of examples that included writers identifying as LGBTQ+. Whereas the state board of education is committed to ensuring students acquire the knowledge and skills necessary to be engaged global citizens in a diverse democratic society. And whereas the State Board of Education has a commitment to promote equity, introduce policies to reduce disparities between students and create safe school environments for all students. Now, therefore, be it resolved that upon the next revision of any District of Columbia State Education standard, the State Board of Education should adopt standards when appropriate that reflect on the political, economic, social, cultural, and scientific contributions and experiences of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. Be it further resolved that the State Board of Education advises the Office of the State Superintendent of Education to provide guidance to teachers and school-based leaders and staff on creating inclusive lessons in science and English language arts classes that align with next, gener next generation science standards and Common Core ELA standards respectively. Be it further resolved that the State Board of Education recommends that the Office of the State Superintendent of Education implement professional development for teachers and school-based leaders and staff to aid them in providing LGBTQ plus inclusive lessons and practices in their classroom, such that the professional development includes workshops for local education agencies and teachers to draft curriculum related to LGBTQ plus topics in their subject areas, lessons on use of inclusive language in the classroom, lessons on ensuring LGBTQ plus students safety and confidentiality while maintaining respect for their name and pronouns, and mandatory diversity training related to the LGBTQ plus community. And be it finally resolved that the State Board of Education recommends that the Office of the State Superintendent of Education survey students within two years of adoption of this resolution to establish baseline data and to gain an understanding of the current experiences of LGBTQ students across the district and what all students know and understand about the contributions and experiences of LGBTQ people in the relevant subject areas. Thank Oxygen. Mem members, are, is there comment on uh, the resolution? And I would go to Representative Chang first. Thank you, President Parker. And, and thanks for uh, moving the puzzle pieces around um, so that I get a chance to, to comment on this and uh, share, share this piece of, of my story with you all um, and, and with folks who are listening in. Uh, this bill means a lot to me and 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 so very very grateful 
to get a chance to discuss it with you. As, as, as a student um, myself, I, I don't remember a single mention of any LGBTQ people in my classwork until I read Thomas Mann, my, single, my senior year of high school. And in Death in Venice, this Nobel Prize winner touches upon his struggles with homosexuality, but never actually names it explicitly. And I remember holding on to this novella, despite the self-hatred that's woven throughout this uh, story, because it was the first time that I saw this aspect of my identity reflected in my classwork. My hope, and, and I think this hope comes true with this resolution tonight, is that future generations of LGBTQ students have more opportunities to see themselves reflected in their classwork and to feel less isolated by their classwork than I did growing up. So I'm proud to be voting yes uh, for SR217, uh, our resolution on LGBTQ plus inclusive education standards. I'm prouder still um, to be voting yes on a bill whose origin stems from the senior capstone project of DC public school student, Will Beckerman. Mr. Beckerman, who recently graduated from School Without Walls, observed a problem and put the time and effort into searching for solutions. Tonight's resolution is the culmination of some of Mr. Beckerman's work. And so um, very, very proud and excited to be voting yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, President Parker. Uh, and obviously, thank you to uh, Will, who wrote this um, resolution, really this entire process of like going through um, the council started from his project, of course, uh, we we met him, I guess we met with him first, like last school year. Um, so it's great to see the boards adopting this resolution. Um, and I, I appreciate you, uh, Representative Chang for uh, telling your story and everything that um, this resolution means to you. Um, and, I'm, and I'm very happy about the resolution being here and getting to vote yes on it. Um, I know Sky is going to read the SAC's uh, official, I guess it's like our first statement um, in support of a resolution. Yes, I am proud of the passing of this resolution. So on the behalf of the Student Advisory Committee. In response to, to the SR 21 through 7 LGBTQ plus inclusive education standard resolution within the District of Columbia, the Student Advisory Committee hereby is in support of the passing of this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Members, is there uh, additional comment? on the resolution. I would just uh, personally like to say uh, thank you to Will uh, uh, for the work done on the resolution. Uh, thank you and shout out to you, Representative Chang for uh, serving as a liaison on this matter. And um, I think these standards are both important but also speak of the progress that we as a society have made, that we as a people in DC and nationally have made. And I had an opportunity um, earlier this week to attend the student advisory committee meeting. And it was very heartening to hear our young people uh, reiterate uh, and iterate the importance of these standards and just making sure all classmates, regardless of background or identity, uh, feel welcome and included. Uh, and it just, let me know that we're uh, on a better path uh, than maybe the way that we found it. So uh, I look forward to voting for the standards as well, but also appreciate all that uh, have helped uh, create them. So thank you. Uh, Representative O'Leary, is this uh, for comment? The hand? I'd like to uh, make a motion that we uh, accept the resolution. Is there a second? Second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor, please say, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Hayworth, please call the roll. Thank you. Vice President Gastoy. Aye. Mr. Chang. Aye. Ms. Wattenberg. Aye. Dr. O'Leary. Enthusiastically, aye. Dr. Sutter. Aye. 
Miss Thompson. What phrase you said? <laughs> Aye. Dr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Patterson. Mr. O'Sullivan. Aye. Ms. Lopez. Aye. Ms. Johnson. Absolutely. Aye. President Parker. Aye. The vote is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, we will now, <laughs> sorry for the confusion, um, and thank you, Representative Chang. Uh, we are now going to go back to the ceremonial resolutions and just to clarify the process. Um, and thank you for your flexibility uh, to make sure that Representative Chang had opportunity to weigh in there. So we will not read the resolutions into the record, but we will reference them by name. We would allow for comment on each resolution individually, and then we will vote on them in block at the end. And so I'll just say that one more time. So we will not read each resolution into the record. Uh, we will go one by one. Uh, Representative or Mr. Hayworth uh, will read them by title. We will then open the floor for comment for, by members that want to weigh in on each one. And then we will vote only once at the end to adopt all of them in block. Um, so Mr. Hayworth, if you could uh, queue up the resolutions and call them one by one, and then uh, any member that wants to address the public. The first resolution is CR 21-19, recognizing National Arts and Humanities Month. Please feel free to raise your uh, hand if you'd like to comment on this resolution. Dr. Sutter. Thank you, Mr. Hayworth. Um, as the person who proposed this re uh, resolution and as chair of the Education Standards Committee, I'm pleased to sponsor this. We are currently working to revise the state's social studies standards. We've also heard from many members of the public on a need for the arts standards for DC to be revisited. So this resolution holds particular meaning. Additionally, the state board has repeatedly called for a focus on well-rounded education, which includes access to arts programming in both classes, extracurriculars, field trips, and other experiences. I'm grateful for all the opportunities that exist within our city for students to encounter the arts and humanities, both those at schools and those in communities. Organizations like DC Strings, Life Pieces to Masterpieces, the Capitol Hill Arts Workshop, Critical Exposure, et cetera, are doing important work to make sure that our students are exposed to the arts and humanities every day. Thank you. Thank you. Is there additional comment? Seeing none, we will move to CR 21-20, recognizing National Principals Month. If there's comment, please use the raise your hand feature. Dr. O'Leary. I would just like to say that um, since becoming a member of the State Board of Education, uh, since I was isolated in a high school for 40 years and I got to meet those principals, uh, it's been a joy meeting all the principals in Ward 4 and, and appreciating principals by uh, a resolution uh, needs to be done a lot more because if 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 all the parents found out in the last year and a half what teachers did because they had to become them, then what principals do have done during the pandemic is unbelievable. So this is well recognized, uh, a well recognized resolution. Thank you, Representative Thompson. So what does uh, Fraser say? And uh, uh, Representative O'Leary say enthusiastically, yes. So I enthusiastically uh, agree uh, with Representative O'Leary. Uh, I was proud to put forth this resolution because being a principal, I think it's one of the hardest jobs that I would never want to have, um, but so appreciate that people do. Uh, they are really where the rubber meets the road. Uh, they are examples in our, in our community of true leadership. Um, and they are often the people who kind of you know, don't get the same love and attention every day. Uh, so uh, it, especially during this time uh, where we are all stretched super thin, um, we should, you know, show a little appreciation. Uh, that's the least we can do for our principals. Thank you very much. Is there additional comment? 
Seeing no additional comment, the next resolution is CR 21-21, recognizing National Domestic Violence Awareness and Prevention Month. Is there comment? Dr. Sutter. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hayworth and members. It was important to me that the State Board recognize Domestic Violence Awareness Month because as a victim and survivor of domestic violence, I understand the impact it can have and the po potential power education has to end the cycle. In my 20s, I lived with a man who physically and emotionally abused me. I am exceptionally lucky to have had friends and family who helped me get out of that home and get safe. I'm deeply grateful for my community and for the counselors who helped me process what I went through and to better understand the warning signs of domestic abuse and the feelings of shame that I carried with me about having been a victim. Young people in DC deserve education that teaches them how to support friends and family who may be experiencing abuse from family or intimate partners, and importantly, about where they can go for help. I'm proud to sponsor this resolution and to express my deep gratitude for organizations throughout the city working to support young people experiencing domestic violence. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sutter. Is there additional comment? Mr. O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, uh, John Paul, um, and thank you, uh, Representative Sutter, for sharing your story with us. We are incredibly appreciative of that, um, and also just want, want you to know that, of course, you are so loved by all of us. Um, and so I really appreciate it, and I think it's great that we're adopting this resolution um, because this is a very important issue that we need to keep uh, bringing awareness on because it affects, obviously, um, everyone involved in the situation, um, and, and, and we know the impact it can have on students as well. Um, so thank you, and I look forward to voting yes on this. Thank you. Is there additional comment? Seeing no additional comment, we will move to CR 21-23, recognizing Learning Disabilities Awareness Month. Is there comment on the resolution? Thank you, Mr. Hayward. Um, so I just want to, first of all, recognize all of the students and families who are navigating um, our school system in an effort to get their, their, um, their needs met. Um, and also I want to give a shout out to the organizations that have provided us with so much uh, important information, including um, AJE and um, School Justice Project and Disco Dis uh, Decoding Dyslexia, um, their input and their advocacy has been uh, tireless and really uh, a value add for us. And then I guess I just would like to say that I hope that this resolution elevates the need, especially now um, more than ever, to take action um, and to just make all of the, the areas where, where our system is not serving our students and families as well as it could, um, that that is rectified, so. Thank you very much. Dr. O'Leary. I'd just like to um, say that it's, it's gratifying that in 2021, um, students who have learning disabilities, I, I don't know how many of you have one uh, on this panel. Uh, I do, I'm ADD. Uh, that in 2021, at least systems have recognized that it's just a disability and it can be helped rather than how it was 50 years ago when uh, people were uh, labeled with names for life, and that uh, the recognition of any kind of a learning disability is something that can be helped by the system, and but we need to keep pushing the system to make sure, especially like in the last year and a half, when our students who did have learning disabilities uh, became even more disabled because of lack of support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there additional comment on this resolution? Seeing none, we will move to CR 21-24, recognizing lights on after school. 
are there comments for the resolution? Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Hayworth. So I just wanna uh, point out that, you know, after school programs and out of school programs are essential at any time, but yet again, I wanna point out that they're even more important now during this um, pandemic and that they help children to develop social, emotional, physical, and academic skills. They help keep our kids safe. Um, they build stronger communities. And that, um, that the programs uh, also continue to, to provide hands-on learning and things that kids don't necessarily get while they're in school during the school day. Um, and so I'm just really excited to uh, raise up this important resolution um, and hope that, you know, I think during this time, there's been a counterintuitive cut um, to a lot of these programs um, when we really should be increasing funding for them. So um, just making that plug. Thank you. Thank you. Is there additional comment on this resolution? Seeing none, I do need to go back. I, I did miss one of our resolutions, which is CR 21. Dash 22, recognizing National Youth Substance Youth Pre Use Prevention Month. Is there a comment on this resolution? No, um, I should have noticed that you missed that uh, because I introduced it. Uh, I, <laughs> I know that uh, currently we have efforts in the district uh, around uh, youth opio opioid use in particular uh, that has been hitting seven and eight pretty hard. Um, I think it's important that uh, as we talk about, uh, I feel like equity is a catch-all word, but like all of like a whole student support um, resolutions like this are important. Uh, just to say that we see uh, what's happening in our communities, we see what young people are struggling with, um, and we wanna make sure uh, that we support them. Thank you very much. Is there additional comment on this resolution? Thank you. Seeing none, the motion is on approval of all six uh, ceremonial resolutions. Mr. President, are we ready to vote? We are. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Hayworth, can you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Representative Gasoy. Aye. Representative Chang. Aye. Representative Wattenberg. Aye. Representative O'Leary. Aye. Representative Sutter. Aye. Representative Thompson. Aye. Representative Reed. Aye. Representative O'Sullivan. Aye. Representative Lopez. Aye. Representative Johnson. Aye. Representative Parker. Aye. The motion is approved unanimously. Thank you, members. Um, we will now move to uh, our other re resolutions that we're voting on. Uh, there are three remaining. Uh, the first of which is <clears throat> uh, related to our education preparation standards. And so as we discussed before, uh, we've been working with ASI for several months now on this. Um, and for members of the public, uh, one of the primary responsibilities of the state board is to review, understand, and vote on statewide standards and policies brought to the state board uh, by ASI. Uh, and tonight we will complete the cycle again for our e education preparation standards that will improve or at least seek to improve the quality of educators graduating from district colleges and universities. So with that, is there a motion um, on SR 21-6? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Uh, um, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Hayworth, can you please read the resolution into the record? State Board of Education resolution to approve standards governing educator preparation provider approval, SR 21-6. Whereas DC official code 38-2652 provides that the State Board of Education shall approve standards for accreditation and certification of teacher preparation programs of colleges and universities or teacher preparation academies. 
whereas the Office of the State Superintendent of Education has authority to regulate teachers, principals, and other instructional employees of the District of Columbia Public Schools and is considering future rulemaking regarding education preparation programs, whereas future rulemaking by OSSI may establish the requirements for state approval of education preparation providers that prepare candidates who are eligible to earn an educator credential in the District of Columbia whereas the educator preparation provider approval process may be designed to ensure that candidates and program completers of education, educa educator preparation providers who seek an educator credential in the District of Columbia receive the training and practicum experiences to enable them to provide effective and highly qual high quality education to District of Columbia public school students. Whereas all currently approved District of Columbia educator preparation providers operating in institutions of higher education are required to be accredited by the Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation. And whereas the State Board of Education has reviewed and approves of the 2022 standards set by the Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the State Board adopts the 2020 Council, excuse me, adopts the 2022 Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation Standards in their entirety for Aussie's use in approving educator pr preparation providers that prepare candidates who are eligible to earn an educator credential in the District of Columbia. Thank you. Is there a discussion on the resolution? Seeing none, um, Mr. Hayward, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Representative O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, President Parker. Uh, I think Sky again is just going to read the SAC statement. In response to the SR 21 through 6 education preparation standard approval resolution, in which seeks to approve standards governing educator preparation provider approval within the District of Columbia, the Student Advisory Committee hereby is in support of the past resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Wattenberg. Uh, thank you. So first I want to um, thank Asi for the uh, terrific work they did coming to bring us uh, presentations on this over a period of time so we could come to understand it. I also want to um, you know, uh, give them a shout out for uh, trying to beef up uh, what was in the reading section which was really important to a lot of people on this board because we know so many students in the city are running into reading programs right off the bat. You can call it dyslexia, you can call it early non-reading. Um, we need to be able to conquer it immediately, deal with it immediately, screen for it immediately, know what to do when kids get it. And so I appreciate that that is in here generally. There's a complication here, which I just want to raise for the future. I want others to understand it. And uh, I think Aussie's on the line. So if I don't say it quite right, uh, I can be corrected. But these are for the broad uh, credentialing standards, the broad accreditation standards. They don't really speak to what are called the program standards, which are handled separately. Um, and we don't see them. And that I, I regret because I would love to be able to be in a position for us to really be able to say, man, these reading uh, the credentials for the, the, uh, the requirements for the uh, preparation programs for reading teachers uh, really meet the high standard that we need. So I just wanna acknowledge that uh, while also uh, appreciating uh, all the, the interaction on this. Thank you. Are there other comments? Seeing none, uh, mm, mm, uh, Representative Thompson. Uh, I just want to acknowledge uh, Caitlin on our staff for a moment um, because I sit on the Educator Practice Committee uh, and I had some questions around this. And I was like, I need to understand what's changing. Uh, and so I really appreciate uh, Caitlin taking her time uh, to call out and pull out what the changes were so we could be informed as representatives um, and I, so I just, you know, want to give credit where credit is due. I do appreciate the engagement from Aussie, uh, but I also appreciate our small but mighty staff. Um, so thank you, Caitlin, for your work. Are there other points of comment? I would just second that. Awesome. I'd like to third it. Um, Fourth it. I'm not going 
Got it. With that, um, Mr. Hayworth, please call the roll. On approval of SR 21-6, Representative Gasoy. Aye. Representative Chang. Representative Wattenberg. Aye. Representative O'Leary. Aye. Representative Sutter. Aye. Representative Thompson. Aye. Representative Reed. Aye. Representative Patterson. Representative O'Sullivan. Aye. Representative Lopez. Aye. Representative Johnson. Representative Parker. Aye. Aye. The motion is approved. Thank you. Um, and thank you to our partners at ASI for their work on this. Um, we will now move to SR21-8, um, which focuses on safe passage. Um, as we've discussed uh, before, students uh, getting to school and home safely is uh, very important for all of us. Um, and we have discussed at length that the district government must do more to protect our students um, from both violence, but also traffic harm and danger. Uh, the, this resolution builds on the work that this body um, and our sister offices have done for years um, and requests specific action from the Department of Transportation, as well as the Deputy Mayor of Education. I wanna thank uh, Representatives Reed and Sutter uh, for their work on this alongside me. Um, and as well as the very impactful um, input from our student representatives. Uh, and so thank you again. With that, uh, Mr. Hayworth, can you please, uh, no, I'm sorry, is there a motion on the floor to uh, accept this resolution? So moved. So move. Is there a second? Second. Second. Being properly moved and seconded. Uh, Mr. Hayworth, can you please read the resolution into the record? State Board of Education resolution on strengthening safe passage for all students in the District of Columbia, SR 21-8. Whereas the DC State Board of Education is committed to ensuring the safety and well-being of all students in the Dis District of Columbia. Whereas the safety of students traveling to and from school must be ensured before we can adequately address the academic achievement of all students. Whereas the district established the School Safety and Safe Passage Working Group to better understand and enhance safety related policies that impact District of Columbia public schools and public charter schools. Whereas in 2020, the Office of the Student Advocate administered surveys and conducted focus groups with students to better understand their experiences traveling to and from school. And whereas OSA collaborated with the Urban Institute to provide analysis of select data from the survey. And whereas more than one third of students expressed feeling either uncomfortable, concerned, afraid, or in danger while traveling to and from school. Whereas the district prioritized seven areas of the city as school year 2021-2022 safe passage priority areas, including Anacostia Metro Station, Columbia Heights, Congress Heights, Good Hope Road Southeast, Lanfon and Waterfront Metro Stations, Minnesota Avenue Metro Station, and Noma Gaudet uh, Metro Station. Whereas rates of homicide, sex abuse, robbery, motor vehicle theft, and traffic fatalities are higher across the district at this date in 2021 as compared to last year, demonstrating a rise in threats to student safety. Whereas conversions about safe passage, excuse me, whereas conversations about safe passage have largely been devoid of solutions for safer transportation infrastructure around the 240 public school campuses in the District of Columbia. Whereas the overwhelming majority of traffic fatalities have occurred in Ward 7, followed by Wards 4, 5, and 8, respectively. And whereas a five-year-old student killed by a driver while riding her bike, two young children and their father struck by a driver at a crosswalk on walk to school day, a 15-year-old student stabbed by a classmate, a six-year-old shot and killed while riding a scooter, and countless other incidents that have claimed the lives of district students, as well as the numerous accounts of bullying and violence, require the district to act urgently to strengthen the safety and well-being of all students during the 2021-22 school year. Now, therefore, be it resolved, that the DC State Board of Education joins the Office of the Student Advocate in calling on the Deputy Mayor of Education to clearly define what safety means at all traditional public and public charter schools in the district. 
be it further resolved that the state board request the Office of the State Superintendent on Education to provide guidance to LEAs regarding protocols for students entering and exiting school buildings, including but not limited to ample coverage of school connected adults charged with monitoring school safety. Be it further resolved that the state board advises that all district schools should have crossing guards at all points of student entry and exit to support school arrival and dismissal. Be it further resolved that the state board requests an updated list of all outstanding requests to the District Department of Transportation regarding enhanced safety measures around the district's public schools and address said request within 90 days. And be it finally resolved that the state board requests that DDOT produce a plan within 90 days to establish traffic calming infrastructure around every pub DC public school to improve safety. Thank you. Uh, members, is there a discussion on this resolution? Uh, Representative Reed. Thank you, President Parker. Um, um, yeah, thanks um, to the board for, um, we started this issue um, with actually Representative Sutter raising it. Um, and then thank you to the board in regards to um, <clears throat> escalating or um, making sure that we actually get this out of the door quickly. We were already doing the work, but then just a variety of events have kind of honed in on um, why <laughs> um, there's some immediacy in addressing these issues. Um, but I also, um, you know, just kind of eat up to even today have a strong, really strong reminder about um, how, you know, I know the traffic safety was the biggest thing that just most recently happened. Um, but, you know, a lot of how the safe passage emerged was around some student violence and just, you know, some of the issues listed um, in regards to person to person situations. And I just want to really hone in on those issues are severely real. We have to figure out how to disrupt cycles of violence that um, our students are engaging in, um, that are they're exposed to in their communities. Um, and um, yeah, just a lot of that, like we can't get away from that piece of the report of the student advocate, which was related to um, some of the more immediate needs. So I know this is a start in regards to really putting the um, the, the the emphasis on DDOT to make sure that they get traffic calming measures, produce a plan. Um, but I feel like we still need to continue to dig in regards to um, how to keep students safe um, from violence, but then also um, not feeling like they need to engage in violent acts. Um, that's gonna be a bigger haul. I know one of the pieces of the resolution does address that, but I know as a board, there are more layers that we're gonna have to dig into around that. So I just wanted to acknowledge it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Sutter. Thank you, President Parker. Thank you, Representative Reed and members of the board. Um, I really appreciate that the board has gotten to this place in this resolution around the interconnectedness of safe routes to school and safe passage. I was very moved by listening to members of our student advisory committee sharing with us additional ways in which they find those things connected, talking about being familiar with alternate bus routes and alternate metro routes when transportation routes go awry like they did this week with metro and how having clear information about transportation safety and feeling like they understand safe ways and can find safe ways home uh, is also connected to their feelings of more sort of bodily safety feeling like they're walking down streets that are well lit will help them feel safer overall so i appreciate that our board is seeing the connectedness between safe routes to school when it comes to roads, lighting, sidewalks, speed tables that prevent drivers from being allowed to drive recklessly, but also how that connects with the larger issues of safe passage that Representative Reed so clearly laid out. So I appreciate that the board combined those two things. Thank you for doing that. And I look forward to supporting this resolution. Thank you. Uh, Representative O'Sullivan. Thank you, President Parker. Um, and just to echo some of the sentiments shared by Representative Sutter, um, I'm very happy to see uh, the State Board taking up this resolution. I'd also like to shout out uh, Mr. Dan Davis um, from the Office of the Student Advocate. He's done a lot of great work. I actually remember my first term um, on the State Board when we were still uh, when we were still in the building. Um, we can, when we still had our Student Advisory Committee meetings, uh, at I think it was 441 Fourth Street. Yeah, um, the 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 wasn't the old council chambers, but uh, Judiciary Square. Um, and I remember he first brought this issue up to us 
Um, he was one of our first guest speakers um, back when I was a sophomore. And I remember he had us do like a survey or an activity or something. Um, and I remember we were sort of in the midst of, uh, of, of the students sort of in the midst of answering how they felt um walking to and from school and I remember hearing about the idea of like safe havens or like businesses for the first time um and I just remember thinking and that was some truly great work that was happening um and unfortunately um because of like the pandemic and something uh Dan has, has shared with us uh in one of our student advisory committee meetings back in September is that a lot of those businesses that have partnered um, with DC schools to serve as places where students can come in um, are now unfortunately shut down um, or, uh, or aren't open to students coming in because of COVID restrictions. I think that's just an issue we wanna highlight to, to, to monitor the situation as it progresses um, because I think uh, one thing we'll find is that uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic and how life is changing is is making some of the solutions we maybe were thinking about in the past more difficult. Um, and I think it's important that we continue to, to look at the situation because uh, obviously everything in terms of like infrastructure, in terms of roads and um, in terms of like street lights and stop, line, stop signs, all that stuff is very important. Um, and I also hope that, uh, especially with, on the issue of like student harassment, um, I'm feeling, feeling scared, maybe later at night for those who have to make a longer commute. It's very important that we keep paying attention um, to what we can do to make those students feel more comfortable. Um, so I'm happy to support this resolution and I look forward to um, some, some, some more uh, work to be done on this issue. And again, I think uh, Sky has uh, our statement to read. So. Fabulous me. I know I'm glitching again, but I still am happy with the passing of this resolution. Safety passage is important for all of us students to have, and especially me growing up and being a board resident and a member. There too have been times where I've been taking public transportation and have the um, and um, there's just been a lot of unfortunate uh, situations that have came across and I feel as though students deserve to be safe and students deserve to feel safe in their communities. And um, I've also lost friends due to gun violence. And so that's a big issue to talk to. But um, as far as in regards to the statement, in response to the SR21-8 safe passage resolution regarding the strengthening of safe passage for all students within the District of Columbia. The Student Advisory Committee hereby is in support of the passing of this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Did my audio cut out? Nope. We heard you. Uh, it was a, a bit shaky, but uh, we made it through. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Uh, Representative O'Leary. Uh, two things. Uh, the first thing is that we, uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, the mayor came out a couple of weeks ago with a big traffic safety safe passage plan. After uh, all of the uh, things that we heard at our public meetings in the last couple of months and also that we talked about in our um, committee hearings. I don't think that's a coincidence. Uh, one thing that we need to be wary of are predators because we've, we mentioned in this about traffic and this thing, but the safe passage from the school to those places, uh, there are a lot of students throughout the city in our schools who are being, there's a, there are fights and violence going on in all of our schools throughout the city right now. There's been a big uptick in that. And, and it's not necessarily, it's, it's almost safe passage within the school rather than safe passage without the school. I just wanted to bring that up because it's not something that anyone acknowledges publicly, but it's happening. I know that we've talked to principals and we know that that's happening in our schools. Thank you for lifting that up. 
Um, Representative Thompson. Uh, thank you uh, for um, getting to this place in the resolution. I uh, was able to attend uh, the Student Advisory Committee meeting um, and I really appreciated their interaction around this. I also really appreciate the board uh, just taking the time to incorporate their feedback because I know there were there was some uh, questions around like how urgent is urgent uh, and I think we got some valuable um, input and I and I know that there's tension sometimes between um, wanting to weigh in and be relevant and like sticking to our our processes and our equity principles. Um, and I think this resolution is better for that. Uh, and so I uh, really appreciate uh, the opportunity uh, to allow for that. Um, and I look forward uh, to what I think will be continued engagement around this issue um, and some next steps. Thank you, uh, Vice President Gaswe. Yes, thank you. Um, just very quickly, in addition to everyone else who has been given a shout out, um, I just wanted to give you a shout out, President Parker, for bringing this to our attention as the emergency that it was. Um, last month, I believe, and, you know, bringing it to this point with uh, input from uh, Representative Park, I mean, uh, Sutter and Representative Reed. So thank the three of you, but um, also just wanted to give you the shout out you deserve for that. Thank you. Uh, not seeing any other comments, I will, I will keep it brief and just say, um, following the tragic death of the five-year-old, uh, in Ward 5, parents uh, asked, demanded that the state board do something. And so this was merely an attempt to be responsive to my constituents' demand. But I also know that that was not an isolated incident. And while it is tragic and horrific for what that family is going through, I also know that this is happening across the city. Um, and what we're seeing now are, are, is that children are paying the price for our inactivity. Uh, and so I do want to acknowledge Representative Sutter, uh, who well before the incident in Ward 5 raised this as a concern. I want to acknowledge the many residents across the city who for years have been beating the drum on uh, the need for a real Vision Zero. Um, and it is not lost on me that we hear a lot about this now uh, for a number of reasons. Um, but I just, uh, the, I, I'm proud that the board is doing what we can within our means uh, to be responsive to the many residents across the city. Um, and I just wanna thank Representative Reed and again, Representative Sutter for their work on this, the student body, but also the push from members across the, this board to what Representative Thompson said to get this right and not rush it for the sake of uh, being re too reactive. Uh, before something that hopefully will lead to uh, a tangible change in the lives of Washingtonians. So thank you all for your work on this. Uh, and with that, Mr. Hayworth, can you please call the roll? Representative Gasoy. Aye. Representative Wattenberg. Aye. Representative O'Leary. Aye. Representative Sutter. Aye. Representative Thompson. Aye. Representative Reed. Aye. Representative O'Sullivan. Aye. Representative o Lopez. Aye. Representative Johnson. Aye. Representative Parker. Aye. The motion is approved. Thank you, members. Um, our last voting item of the evening um, is around a, an adjustment to our uh, COVID-19 vaccination uh, requirement for staff. Uh, you will recall last month, we approved the vaccination requirement itself. Um, you will also remember there was a push for us to um, not have an opt-out option uh, and ensure that all staff uh, were mandated to get the COVID-19 uh, vaccination in order to keep themselves safe. Uh, but each other uh, safe. And so tonight we will consider modifying that requirement to eliminate the weekly testing option or an opt-out option, uh, as some may understand it. Uh, we do not consider this action lightly, but in the current pandemic, 
uh, understand that uh, we must all do our part to limit the spread of the virus and to show our commitment um, um, to being good neighbors, if you will. Um, and so with that, is there a motion for us to modify our COVID-19 vaccination requirement policy to eliminate the weekly testing option? Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It has been seconded. Uh, is there a discussion on uh, this matter? Not seeing oh, Representative Weidenberg. Just to note, and we talked about for people who weren't there, we talked about this at our working meeting. And one, one reason we didn't change it on that night was we did want to both check with our lawyers, but most importantly, check with the other offices to make sure people could live with that. And the answer was yes, which is why I think it looks like we're going towards a unanimous vote here. Yeah. I, I do want to underscore that we do not take it lightly and understand that members of the public are in different places and at uh, with this. Uh, and um, with that, uh, Mr. Hayworth, can you please call the roll? Representative Kasoy. Hi. Representative Wattenberg. Aye. Representative O'Leary. Aye. Representative Sutter. Aye. Representative Thompson. Aye. Representative Reed. Aye. Representative O'Sullivan. Aye. Representative Lopez. Aye. Representative Johnson. Aye. Representative Parker. Aye. The motion is approved. Thank you. Uh, members, that concludes the vote, uh, voting portion of our meeting. We are now to new business. Are there any items of new business or announcement that you would like to make at this time? Uh, Representative Reed. Just a reminder um, for board members to use the constituent feedback form to um, either share with your constituents or as you're fielding calls to um, document things so that we can get, you know, feedback collected in an organized manner. Thank you. Thank you. Members, are there other points of new business or announcements? Not seeing any, is there? That form is now also on the SBOE main page. Uh, and that is at sboe yes. <laughs> at dc.gov uh, for members of the public. Um, not seeing any other points of new business. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Uh, there is a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. second. Being properly moved and second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. The ayes have it. It is now 9.15 p.m. and this public meeting of the State Board of Education is adjourned. Thank you to members of the public uh, for sticking with us. Enjoy your night. Bye.